All right, we're going to get started. 6.30. I'm just going to guess that we're going to be done tonight at 9.30. I'm just going to say it out loud right now. Manifest. I'm gonna tr we're going to try to manifest. 9.30. Okay. All right, so the first thing to do, we're going to call this meeting to order. Um, we're going to re review and approve the agenda. So um, there were a couple of uh, addendums. One was a street closure, and the other um, was a net zero energy resolution. So I'm going to assume that we can add the... Uh, street closure to the consent agenda, and um, we're going to put the net zero energy resolution uh, as uh, just before the uh, energy efficiency update with Kate Stevenson when she's here. Uh, so, uh, any other changes? So, uh, we'll consider the agenda uh, approved without objection. And so on to general business and appearances. So this is a time for anyone um, from the public to address the council on any issue that is otherwise not on our agenda. And if you would keep your uh, comments to about two minutes or less. Great. Hello, Mayor Watson, councilors. Thank you for hearing from us tonight. Uh, my name is Tom Applemore. I am a proud resident of the Fighton Third District. Uh, <laughs> I live on School Street. Um, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of what I think has been a really exciting thing around town, which has been the introduction of the bird scooters. Um, I am someone who grew up in Vermont, but uh, moved out of state. I lived in New York for a period of time, bounced up and down the East Coast on a couple of jobs. And in some of those situations, I got a chance to live a sort of car-free lifestyle for a period of time. Those were very walkable places that I was living. Montpelier, I live here without a car as well, but it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of the availability and the ease of getting from place to place. And as someone without a car, uh, I would say that at least in the brief trial period that's been uh, in effect so far, it has been a huge success and a real game changer for me. I commute every day. Commute, I guess, is a grand word. It's not that far. Uh, all the way down to 155 State Street. It's about a 20, 25 minute walk, um, but a very quick bird ride. And I've spoken to a lot of peers, um, a lot of people in the community who are curious, interested about using the scooters, and almost unanimously they've had positive experiences. Um, and it, it, is a, it is a really nice thing. I have found myself going on short trips to support local businesses that I might otherwise not have taken had I been walking the whole way. Um, they are very easy to ride. I was a little apprehensive at first before I'd given it a try. Um, but you scoot around town like a breeze. It's great. Um, so I know that there's a trial period going on right now. I know that the weather is changing soon, and there will be a sort of weather reprieve until the spring. But uh, can't say enough good things about it. I think it is a really, really nice way. We can reduce our carbon footprint. We can make the city uh, more walkable, more pedestrian friendly, and uh, more accessible for a wide range of people. So I'd urge you to keep with the program. Thank Thanks you. so much. Uh, Hi, Donna, yeah. Have a question? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, so when you went through the app, did you feel it was clear enough in directions so you knew you had to be on the road and follow the rules of the road? It is very explicit throughout. The, it actually refers to local reg regulations mandating helmets. Um, that is, I think, unskippable as you're trying to access the app. So yes, that was very unambiguous in my experience at least. Good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Any further comments? <coughs> Uh, in the interest of saving some time and oh, not, if you oh, would, Stephen in, Whitaker, uh, Montpelier. Uh, in the interest of not diluting the conversation that's on the agenda for later, I'd like to raise some concerns, uh, issues for the council's consideration. I don't expect you'll be able to take any action on it, but we seem to have a recurring problem with a number of organizations of which Montpelier is a member. Central Vermont Public Safety Authority has been missing statutory deadlines for minutes availability repeatedly, including at the last meeting and a meeting prior from two meetings prior to that. Minutes are still not available and the person responsible is an attorney. Um, but when I raised this at last week's meeting, it was met with response from council members and board members that so what? It's the law. Yeah, we we're not in compliance with the law. Too bad. And that's not appropriate. It, it's the law on 
minutes and public records and open meetings is not aspirational. It is definitive. And when we stray from that, we are outlaws. So Central Vermont Public Safety Authority is one. Capital Fire Mutual Aid is another. They had a meeting in September which involved FirstNet, which is something else you need to be aware of. Those minutes have not been made available. Uh, the, we've got a recurring problem. I, I did have a friendly exchange with John about the one time that a, a new person was taking minutes and they were a little late getting on the website. I'm not trying to be uh, the police. I think all of us need to be very diligent and take, I would actually ask you to consider a resolution uh, to be drafted later that takes a firm stand on your commitment to complying with that law, both open meeting and completeness of minutes. The fact that I raised the issue of the missing minutes at the last week's meeting of CVPSA and my raising that issue is not in the draft minutes that came out today. So what goes in the minutes is also a concern. Uh, if I could just mention, completeness of minutes is not a requirement. They have to be up by uh, five days afterwards. And for example, Rutland City simply takes photographs of the raw handwritten notes to post that. And that is compliant with the law. And that's been consistently held. What's important is that something be up there within five minutes, but that, but the, uh, five days, five minutes. Ha! <laughs> that's what it feels like these days. But I just want to be clear on that. That um, make you defensive. No, I, I just want to be clear on that. It's not about anybody being defensive. I just want to be clear on that. I, I'm aware that, I guess my point is, I'm asking you to consider what is the purpose of minutes if it's not to inform the public so, so that they can. I understand that. If you're looking for complete minutes in five days, I'm not your city clerk. I, allow, I would suggest you elect another one. There's a lot of other stuff going on, too. I did not mean to put you on the defense. I'm just, I'm just giving you information. And develop a policy of whether public comments, including handouts. The other example I'll give, Green Mountain Care Board. I wrote a white paper. I spoke about $50 million in missing intellectual property. And both the white paper and the comments are missing from the minutes. Stephen, um, the policy of the minutes of the city of Council of Montpelier are mine. A resolution that they pass here will not change that fact. The policy begins and ends with me. Now, the council can vote to change the minutes and alter them however they want, but that doesn't change the fact that the policy begins and ends with me. And I create action minutes, which is considered best practices. In fact, I go beyond action minutes, but I am steadfastly against characterizing the comments of people who come before in my minutes. Like I say, another city clerk might be all for it. I am not. So thank you for making a note of that. And we can further discuss it later. Yes, OK. Thank you. thank you. Any further comments? How's it going? My name's uh, Rob Goodwin. I live here in town. Uh, I just want to thank City Council for uh, doing this little bird experiment. Um, I uh, rode, rode them from my house to the uh, link bus uh, at the Department of Labor Parking Ride several times. Uh, it's a long, long cold walk, uh, very quick riding the bird. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, for or against them, the trial. The trial should continue, and I know that. Uh, Information is being taken by uh, by the city and by the police department to try and make it safe and uh, that sort of thing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Further comments? Okay. So we're going to move on. Uh, so the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? So move. Second. Further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, and that was with that, I assume everybody understood that that was with that added item, okay. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so we have uh, a number of uh, appointments to make. So I think what uh, is likely 
to happen is that uh, we will hear from all of the applicants and then go into executive session and come back out to make all of the appointments together. Uh, so the first one is for the investment committee and I think we only have um, one applicant for the investment committee. Is Lisa Stewart here? No? Okay. Right, moving on. Um, so the Design Review Committee, um, if there were two appointments for, uh, or I'm sorry, there were two applicants for one seat, um, Nick Lowe and Martha Smirsky. So are there are there of you here? No, interesting, okay. Um, moving on then, um, an appointment to the Energy Advisory Committee, uh, Donald Devoal. No, okay, wow, that was unusual, <laughs> all right. And Lisa was the only applicant to the Complete Streets group, and she's probably still not here. Um, so, team, one hypothesis is that we should just go into executive session. What do you think? Okay. Do we have a motion? Still moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we will be right back. Okay, motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. So we have some appointments to make. Uh, this is going to be all at once sort of thing. So I move that we appoint Lisa Stewart to the Investment Committee, Martha Smirsky to the Design Review Committee, Donald Devoil to the Energy Advisory Committee, and Lisa Stewart to the Complete Streets Group. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you all uh, for your service, uh, if you're listening. All right. Uh, okay, so moving on. So now we have an item um, uh, regarding the appointment to the Central Vermont Internet uh, re representative. And so um, if you, if uh, Jeremy, I know you're here, uh, Dan, and Stephen, um, uh, you're all welcome to come uh, up, to sit up here in the front. Um, uh, now, to be fair, uh, we have read what um, you, I, I'm going to make the assumption, team, that we have all read um, what was submitted to us. Um, so there's no need necessarily to go um, over any uh, um, of that content. Um, we'll have a time for, uh, you know, if the council wants to ask any um, Claire, oh yes, yeah, please feel free, yeah. Um, uh, we'll have a time to ask some clarifying questions, and then, um, uh, Stephen, if you want to, you know, make some kind of a statement, that's, you're certainly welcome to, and um, we'll go from there. So if you would just uh, run down the line, introduce yourselves, and, um, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start, uh, because you know me, so... Uh, as Dan Jones, I uh, wanted to introduce uh, Jeremy Hansen and uh, Phil Fayek, who are the chair and the vice chair of the Central Vermont Internet. And uh, I'm here in my role as the uh, board representative for you, but uh, they, are, they have more prepared this, so I just wanted to be the uh, sort of formal introduction. Thank you. And Dan introduced me, but I'm Jeremy Hansen, the, the chair of Central Vermont Internet. Phil Fayek, vice chair. Great. Thank you. Um, if, is there anything further beyond what you submitted in writing that you wanted to add? If not, that's fine. No, I mean, um, the Central Vermont Internet Board voted um, for us to communicate a message to you, and you all have that message. Okay. Great. Um, any questions uh, from the Council for uh, Central Vermont Internet crew? Okay. Actually, I do um, have yes, a Jack. question. Sorry. Um, I watched the uh, the video of the meeting. Um, aside from the uh, discussion of the uh, question of whether there was a conflict of interest, was there uh, any notice to uh, Mr. Whitaker in advance of the meeting that this would be uh, taken up by the board? Formally, no, but there was certainly, uh, as I understand it, individual conversations had um, outside of more meetings or outside of minutes okay. that, that his behavior was um, not acceptable. Okay, thanks. Further questions? No? Okay. Uh, Stephen, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I, I would. Um, 
Stephen Whitaker alternate for Montpelier on this CV fiber board. Um, I think it's important to note there's, there's some dimensions to this question which are both jurisdictional and protected speech. I have been careful not to represent the city of Montpelier in my comments regarding this level of accountability. I've done so only in the public comment section of the meetings. And, and I clearly distinguished when I first raised this issue. But as you know, public records violations are something I've been working on for decades. And when a new organization starts getting off on the wrong foot, by not adhering to law with public records minutes availability, um, it's important to call them on it. And so I appealed to the head of the agency on the, at the end of May for a meeting that was held on the 8th, and we still didn't have minutes. And the head of the agency in this case is Mr. Hansen, and he's also a select board member in Berlin, so he should be clearly familiar with open meeting law and public records and minutes requirements. And he just dismissed it, brushed it aside, did not respond according to law <coughs> with a response to an appeal to the head of the agency and said it's somebody else's job to find them. Uh, and, I, and that resulted in me copying the whole board and then Dan saying, in effect, we're new, we can get away with breaking the law. And I'm paraphrasing. And that elicited a response from the Secretary of State, which I have provided the mayor with copies. I think you all have them now. That email thread lays out both the, the tact and the decorum and the politeness with which I'm making these requests. I mean, the most unpolite, or I forget the characterizations of my behavior, uh, is your misguided effort to dodge the issue by claiming that you're not the custodian of the records is troubling. I'm, but Jeremy and I had had prior conversations where I said, this organization isn't born yet. It's going to make decisions of what it call itself, what timeline we're going to build, what rates we're going to charge. And the press had already taken his decisions of those things and published them. So. This is not about behavior. This is about accountability and transparency. And, and the Secretary of State's comments back that up. I am a stickler for transparency and accountability. When items are missing from the minutes, even the most recent minutes of the meeting, where two months ago the, the governing board of CV Fiber made a motion to direct Jeremy to liaison with CVPSA and Paco in order such that that plan you're going to see at next month's joint meeting would be informed by the potential economies of scale and scope. And two months later, that still hadn't occurred. And so I, I called that to the attention. But then the minutes don't reflect who's responsible for those. So. We need, if this CV fiber is going to succeed, we need to build accountability and transparency in from the beginning and to shoot the messenger to try to push me off the governing board is, is more an attempt to evade accountability than anything else. Um, you are well, all well familiar with my uh, persistence in account towards accountability and transparency. So I, I don't apologize for that. But the fact that I'm doing it in public comment sections of the meeting as a citizen, as I signed this letter, not representative or alternate of Montpelier, but as you know, citizen advocate, uh, is evidence there. Even more so, it, I didn't. I abstained from the motion. Dan wasn't present at the last meeting, and I rather than mix the role of citizen advocate and Montpelier rep, I abstained from even voting when I could have voted no on the motion, wouldn't have made much difference. But uh, the time frame for when this option of trying to ask that I be removed to vote was maybe 10 minutes. So I couldn't help but the similarity of a, a Trump rally of, you know, lock her up. 
Uh, it's kind of mob rule. It's not, not the way to do business. Uh, I've asked this city council to get more involved in oversight and engagement with this new entity, help it get on the right track. Uh, you've been preoccupied, but that invitation is still open. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions for Stephen? I, I do just have a quick follow-up. Um, so I was looking back at your application to be the alternate, um, and one of the things that we're trying to, um, well, we have a different application process now, um, but are you, I, I'd like you to sort of further discuss a couple of things. One, um, I'm curious if you're a physical resident of Montpelier, but also two, I'm curious about whether or not you perceive there to be a, a conflict of interest. Uh, that's one of the questions that we ask on the new applications. Um, you know, so not even talking about the, the open meeting stuff, just the sort of the, the other piece about purchasing the domain and, and those other uh, questions. I think that's important information for the council. I reside both in town in a shared space and in, in a nearby town. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, for privacy reasons, don't disclose the person I sleep with. So that's... Uh, is, it, that's it, that is one of the questions on our application. So a, as we sort of go through this process, we've redone it a little bit. And so one of the questions that we do ask is about residency, but conflicts of interest is, okay. is the other sort of big piece. I don't see, I don't perceive a conflict of interest at all. The fact that uh, one individual chose a name which has regulatory implications, and the board has since, at mine and others, urging decided to not do business as Central Vermont Internet, but as CV Fiber. And Central Vermont Internet has regulatory implications that in effect the FCC would preempt the state's ability to put backup power and resiliency requirements and testing requirements on the network. So I have had to continually fight. I early on at the first or second meeting or in an emails to Jeremy asked that we get legal counsel on board so that we Somebody who is a lawyer could advise the, the, the governing board on this topic. But it's very important that we not define ourselves as internet and forfeit the ability to regulate in, within the state. There's a new FCC order that, that Chairman Pai reversed Chairman Wheeler's uh, efforts with net neutrality and this, we lost all the state-owned microcells connectivity because the PUC was now preempted because that used an internet DSL circuit to feed the backhaul to the microcells. So I continue to raise this, much to the annoyance of the people who don't, on the governing board who don't understand it, but I feel like I'm doing my due diligence in doing so. And Charlie Larkin, a bo other board member of Design Access Network, which registered the name, uh, did it with the intent of protecting uh, the options for building a sound, resilient, and reliable network, which I have been working on. A design access network was formed to do 24 years ago. Further questions? Yes, good. Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this. It's something of a hypothetical. But uh, if we were to ask you to step down as an alternate, uh, would you continue to uh, speak as an uh, interested citizen at these meetings? And how, how do you feel that that would change your role as it, it has stood so far? No, it's, it's a fine hypothetical, and it's a, it's a plausible scenario. The, you wouldn't ask me to step down. You would just say, I'm removed. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my point, my, there's only about three or four people on that board that have any experience in building networks or even know what they're made of, and I'm one of them. And my contributions to st steering the direction and setting the priorities have it happen throughout the meetings. Virtually, an, I speak in turn on virtually every item that is discussed by the governing board, and I wouldn't have that option as my only option would be to speak at the public comment period without having been informed by what happens later. It would not be effective. Further questions? Yeah. Um, 
and maybe this is out of turn, but I'm curious to know if uh, any of the other people at the table have any responses at this point to Stephen or, or any further information to add? I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm able to refute almost point by point um, the assertions that he's making here right now. I mean, in the interest of you getting out of here on time, I'm not sure that that's useful or helpful. I mean, if there's any specific issues that you want me to address or to talk about, I'm more than happy to do so. I mean, in terms of him speaking in turn, I was, I was extremely close at one meeting to um, in invoking the process to eject him from the meeting when we had a meeting in Middlesex. He was interrupting so many times and breaching the proper protocol. So that's, for example, always speaking in turn, sorry. This is not, it's not true. Um, his assertion that he's the only one who knows anything about building networks is also untrue. We are very tech heavy, which is, un which is unfortunate in, uh, in a board. Um, it would be nice if we had more finance people. We have one, we do have a lawyer on the board, but we have a lot of technical skills, um, including designing networks and understanding the technology at a pretty deep level. For those of you that, that don't know me, I'm a computer science professor at Norwich University and I, I have taught networking in the past. In my previous life, I've uh, administered and built networks in the past for small companies up to Fortune 500 companies. This is, not, this is not foreign and I'm confident in the technical chops of more than just the handful of folks that are being asserted here. So I mean, if there's anything else that you'd like me to address, I'm happy to do so, but um, going through all of them would be I'm, I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure that that would be helpful. Ashley. I, um, I'm just, I pulled up your uh, email that was part of what we had all received on the council. Um, <coughs> how many people uh, were voting members at the meeting where there was a motion made to request the council to remove uh, Mr. Whitaker? I think we had a nearly full board. I would have to look back at the minutes. Um, probably 14 or 15 people, and I think there were two abstentions. Right. So that so everyone else voted. Correct. So it was like yeah, tw um, like 12-0-2. Okay. If you had to break it out, I think. Further questions? I, I think. Oh, go ahead. In that context, the I think it's important to consider the the issues on which I've been perceived to have been disruptive. The first one is the emails that you see the the. the over the missing minutes uh, from the first. The second was a request for data, which was forewarned. As soon as date, uh, one of the members announced he had data from Washington Electric Co-op, in the open meeting, I said, I'm going to make a request for that. I made a request for that, and then I had to appeal to the head of the agency. Again, the request, the appeal to the head of the agency was not responded to in compliance with law, and then the data was destroyed, which has another set of implications. And the fact that these, the person responsible for not responding to these public records appeals to the head of the agency is not identified in the minutes should be an indication of the problem. Um, the There was a. There was one more issue that came up. Oh, whether or not I I moved for an executive session, that, in order to discuss not only whether or not I would need to sue, on this issue of the destroyed records, and not provided, but whether the. District itself, should litigate in order to get at the utility data, which is going to fundamentally be needed in order to design these networks. And it's a recurring problem. Green Mountain Power gives out all its pole and line data, whereas Washington Electric and Morrisville Electric say it's all secret. So that didn't get in the minutes either. The fact that <coughs> folks perceive a more vigorous, and oh, the third big issue is it took seven months for the paperwork to get delivered to the Secretary of State. The vote was done in May, in March, and it wasn't until October 9th that the certification of the existence of this thing was filed with the Secretary of State. And I called him on it. I said, that's just not the way we need to do business. That's not accountable. It's not timely. And now the six-month start clock starts, which is a prohibition, a timeout period in which the district cannot spend any money. So 
These are very fundamental and core issues of accountability. And this body, the folks that want to shoot the messenger, are annoyed by the fact that I call these to the attention. And that's why I was insisting on doing it in public session. Thank you. Further questions? OK. Um, so we have a request uh, to, from, the, from the board to remove Stephen Whitaker from his appointment as uh, alternate delegate. Um, one possibility is that uh, we can uh, have a motion. Another possibility uh, is uh, we could, so we could, uh, because this is a matter of an appointment, we could still uh, go into an executive session to deliberate ourselves. Um, what is your preference team? And you could also, I could also ask you to table it as well in that you don't have to do anything here. I guess I would move that we go into executive session. Okay. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, we will be right back. Okay, so do we have a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Do we have a motion? Yes. At this point, as the president of the city council, I would move that we uh, replace Stephen Whitaker as an alternate on the Central Vermont Internet Board. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. And uh, so just as a um, matter of form, um, we're going to, we'll be advertising for that seat. And um, uh, thank you, Stephen, for your service. And we want to, you know, just acknowledge that, uh, you know, transparency and uh, accountability in government is important. And, um, uh, you know, holding the, our collective uh, feet to the fire is a, is a fine thing. Um, uh, but the manner and the tone, they, they do matter. Um, so thank you. And uh, we'll be finding someone new. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the parklet ordinance. So this is the second reading of this ordinance, or the or changes to this ordinance. And we had one change, which was um, the uh, last time it said something like um, November, um, November 15th, when it should have said uh, October 15th. So I think that's what it says now. Um, so comments on the ordinance. Um, so yeah, we'll have co uh, comments from the public and then council discussion. Open a public hearing? Is that the oh, thing? yes. Thank you. We're going to open the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. All right. Go, go ahead, Dan. Hi, Dan Groberg, Executive Director of Montpelier Live and Liberty Street resident. Um, Montpelier Live uh, and the Montpelier Business Association would like to request that the council uh, change the proposed uh, date. Um, you had planned to amend the date from November 8th or something like that to October 15th. Uh, we would like it to read uh, through the third Friday in October, such that the parklets would still be in place during Moonlight Madness. Uh, hopefully several of you were downtown on Friday for Moonlight Madness and saw that it was an incredible success and brought a lot of um, energy and vibrancy to downtown and that the parklets were uh, well utilized on that evening. Um, so we would like to request that they be um, in place through the, that event is always on the third Friday in October. Thank you. Thanks. Further comments from the public? OK, uh, any council discussion? I have a quick question that maybe Dan's best suited to answer. Um, I guess. So I, I understand the request, and I think it's a reasonable request. But my concern is that if we say no later than the third Friday, doesn't that sort of greatly increase the potential to have them removed by then? You can certainly make it later than that. <laughs> I knew that was going to be your comeback. But, um, um, no, I, I mean, we're, we understand the um, impetus for the council to move it earlier um, than the November date. Uh, we just like it to stay sort of as late as possible. The um, whole MBA um, at our last meeting agreed that um, the vibrancy and vitality that the parklets contribute to downtown is really important. Um, and I know you've heard from um, another individual who had some comments about moving the date even earlier to release those five parking spots. But the MBA feels uh, strongly that the, the parklet vitality sort of outweighs those parking spots, especially during the tourist season. Great, thank you. 
Further comments or questions from the council? Yeah, go ahead. I, I think probably a lot of us were downtown on <coughs> last week on Moonlight Madness. It was beautiful weather for it. There was a lot. There were a lot of people downtown. There was a lot going on. I thought it was a. It really just illustrated how great it can be and how, and the value of doing things like the parklet, parklets to attract people to uh, to be out and about downtown. And so I I will make a motion to. Uh, amend the uh, time to uh, the third Friday in October. After the third Friday? After the third, like the third Saturday, maybe? That's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, is there a second? I'm just looking at the calendar. If it's the third Saturday. That might not necessarily be a third Friday, would it? <laughs> Depending on when it falls. I mean, it gets, yes. <laughs> I think it gets really tricky. So how about the 25th? OK. Uh, well, how do you feel about that? It's fine. Okay. All right, so the 25th then. Is there a second? Oh, I'll second it. Okay. Uh, further discussion on this piece of it? Yes. I think that we might need to uh, adjust the, the fee provision to, to line up with the uh, yes. time that it's open. So my motion includes that uh, provision as part of it. Is that okay? <coughs> uh, yes, if there is no objection. Don, is that cool with you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so it's a couple pieces. Any further discussion about that? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Any further comments about from the public or council on the rest of this ordinance? No? Okay, sorry, I'm all, I'm all distracted. Too many things to sign up here. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so I think at this point we would close the, we're going to close the public hearing. And uh, do we need to, I'm just checking to see if we need to um, pass any motion regarding uh, the final version of this. Yeah, I think we do. I, I move that we yep. amend the ordinances as, uh, <coughs> pursuant to the proposal as amended uh, earlier this evening. And, and uh, I think we need to approve the second reading of it. Okay. Can we, we can include that? That's part of it, yes. Okay. Second. Okay, great. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Okay. Thank you. Did you and you're good with that, John? Are you yeah. Okay. No, all good. Okay. I'm there. I'm on it. Awesome. Okay. We're moving right along. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, the Art Synergy Master Plan. So I know there's a number of people here for that, so uh, welcome to the front table. So you just need to sign it here? Yeah, Not apparently you do. Oh, that's that. No. Oh, no. no. Bill, apparently. That's fine. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go, hard. <laughs> beautiful, Hi. beautiful hard copies. It is great to be here again, talking about beauty and inspiration and community engagement, and we're happy to bring that energy to the council meeting tonight to really talk about uh, the process that's been happening for the last three years uh, around the Public Art Master Plan. I'm going to frame up really quickly where we've been and how we got here just in about two minutes' time. Uh, Amanda Golden is back, our consultant on the project, and uh, Nathan's been very involved in the uh, advisory team and on the uh, and on their work. And so Amanda's going to talk a little bit about who was engaged in the process and what we heard, and then I'm going to wrap up very briefly about the action plan that we're suggesting and, and the invitation for action from the council. So uh, we are here because of the council's investment in this process th three years ago when they pledged $50,000 to match a potential grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, which was awarded and launched this uh, public planning to identify uh, and create a master plan for public art. And of course, we also commissioned an artwork for the Taylor Street Transit Center at that time as well. What we're asking tonight for the council to consider is to adopt the plan as public policy and I think everybody has seen the plan or 
I think I've gone, I have met with everybody and gone over questions previously about the plan. Uh, so uh, we're going to just touch highlights on it. So we'd like the plan adopted this evening. And also we'd like the council to pursue a path forward in the budgeting process to identify $50,000 in FY20 budget to fund the first year of the plan. We understand that that decision can't be made tonight, but we would like to have the council express its interest in pursuing that in the budgeting process. Great. Thanks, Paul. So uh, how did we get to where we are today? We spent a lot of time asking the community about their vision. Uh, and I kind of want to just touch on who we asked and what we asked them. And you can kind of uh, review this on page six is where it begins. We had over 200 participants. Uh, to kick off the process, we engaged over 40 stakeholders. Uh, we met with them either individually or in small groups. And many of you I have met with as well. Uh, many of the old council members, actually, a lot of you are new faces that I have not yet had the privilege to meet. Um, we ask about how public art relates to their sense of place, uh, relates to building and uh, enhancing the identity of Montpelier, uh, how it engages the community into thinking about what they think about themselves, also what they think about their community and how it can increase pride and their attachment to their city, and then ultimately what their vision is for the city when it comes to public art. Uh, we had our first meeting to kick off the process at Lost Nation. It was a pop-up museum where people were able to bring things that they thought represented their home. It was really interesting to see all the different objects that people brought. Very excited. Um, and they were asked to just bring those objects so that we could understand what are those special qualities about Montpelier that don't exist anywhere else that should be showcased and celebrated through your public art strategy. We also had three artist-led workshops. Uh, the first was a collaboration with Kim Bent at Lost Nation, uh, Mime and Clown, Rob Merman, and then we also had Alana Precourt Finney, who was a choreographer, and we really uh, asked the public to think about, through movement, um, of how performance art can be public art. The second teaching workshop was with uh, teaching artist Gallery Savore at Main Street Middle, and I hope all of you were able to see that installation that uh, is actually on the front cover of the plan. Um, but students were um, creating wind sculptures and each of those sculptures had small storytelling elements about the things that they love about Montpelier. Uh, they were really beautiful, and some of the photos are in the document. Um, uh, the third workshop was led by Ward Joyce, and it focused on public spaces. We had five other artists and architects who helped sketch ideas for how public art and placemaking can live in Montpelier. And those were site-specific, and you can actually see the outcomes of some of those uh, sites in the document, uh, beginning on page 30. And then we also hosted three artist talks at uh, Bookspieler Records, Domina's, and then we also had one at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And that was just really to get the community in to talk about what is public art, how does it live, and what does it look like when it's being commissioned and then installed. And then lastly, uh, you know, we had this really interesting info sharing, brainstorm, idea mashing Q&A session that I think is so Montpelier, um, where we shared kind of how we got to the point that we were at. And uh, we brought in three experts to talk through, through um, the process and what public art is. Uh, Sarah Katz from Burlington, um, Lars Torres from Local 64, and then Gallery Savore, who is the founder of the River Lights Lantern Parade. And then all of that was also backed up by an online survey. So anybody who couldn't participate also had the opportunity to participate online and let us know what they thought. And I, I, I wanted to kind of go through all of those items to really show you how many hands touched this process so that you can understand, uh, you know, it's been three years since you've committed the funding, but it's also been a year and a half of people hearing about public art and anxiously anticipating the outcome of this document. And, and we're very proud to put it forward because we believe that it represents uh, the community's voice. Um, and then backing up all of those uh, public meetings and um, opportunities for input was an advisory council who really played an integral role in making sure that the recommendations were reflective of what is possible in Montpelier. And so we do feel that the recommendations that Paul is going to talk about really do reflect the next steps in the future for public art in Montpelier. Um, so 
you might be asking, what did we hear? Great. You talked to the community. What did we hear from them? And uh, on page nine, you can start kind of flipping through what we actually heard from the community. There are six points. Uh, I'm not going to read them because you can read them the, on, uh, on your own time. Uh, but the thing that I think is really important about what came out of the planning process is the vision for the public mm -hmm. art program that your city, we hope, tonight will kick off. Um, and, and I do want to read that. The vision of the Montpelier Public Art Program is to enrich the lives of all citizens through honoring the city's history, celebrating its culture, and creating rich experiences for residents and visitors through art and public places. Um, and and that, that vision statement was really worked through and talked about over and over because we always came back to celebrating who Montpelier is, but also uh, celebrating the creative culture and the diversity that um, is, is here in Montpelier and really celebrating those quality of life items that exist, that everybody knows and loves about, about Montpelier. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I wanted to talk about before uh, Paul goes into talking about the priority action plan actually begins on page 30. And a lot of these conceptual projects and programs are direct outcomes uh, of a lot of the ideation that we had throughout the planning process. And you can see the sketches on 31, and as those kind of go through this chapter, um, these are the outcome of one of the uh, artist-led workshops by Ward Joyce. Um, it's a lot to talk about public art and how it lives and in, in the abstract, but this workshop really allowed community members to kind of flush out how public art could actually live in spaces that are in Montpelier. Not just conceptually, what does public art look like in a park or what does it look like in an alley? But these really presented an opportunity for the public to view what public art could be in those specific locations. Uh, and when you adopt the plan tonight, hopefully, uh, you're not bound for implementation of these projects and programs, but these are really meant to be conceptual in nature for the newly seated Public Art Commission uh, that will be seated next year. Um, and I did want to highlight uh, some that I thought were really exciting for the community. Um, the one that I think is a really easy to implement public art program is on page 36, and that's the bridges. Something that kept coming up was your history of trains and moving people over your rivers, and these bridges should be highlighted and celebrated. Not every city has a river, and not every city uses bridges to move to different places in the city, and how can art be something that celebrates that special element of your city? Um, you'll also see that it goes into programs. So programs are things that don't have specific locations, but are more um, programming opportunities to get art into the community. Uh, and, and some of those are vacant storefronts to galleries. Um, there are some really interesting programs like Sculptures on Loan that are low cost, but really have a high impact. Um, and you can explore these projects and programs if you hadn't already, but they're really exciting. And um, I hope that when the Public Art Commission is seated, that they also find these to be as exciting uh, as the planning process did and those who participated. Great, she's looking at me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so just exactly what does this call us to action? What, is, what do we want to see happen as a result of this work? And how do we think it can transform Montpelier? So please open your hymnals to page 47, uh, <laughs> where the priority Push action plan verses. begins. And I'm just going to... I'm just going to hit highlights. We're not going to. I'm not going to read all through this, but I, I, the first two uh, terms, the short term and the midterm, really articulate nicely uh, our aspirations for this. Of course, we talk about key partners. Uh, one thing, the primary thing that the plan will create is a public art commission, which will lead all of the work of the public art plan. So, uh, the public key partners with the public art commission or key partners in the plan are listed here. We have some strategic partners, and those lists, of course, will grow as the work grows. But starting on page 49, really, uh, the big goals on, on the first two years, of course, we want the plan adopted as public policy, which we hope will happen tonight, to create the Public Art Commission. We're also requesting, of course, in this first year that we pursue $50,000 to fund the plan and FY20 so that we can begin implementing and drawing energy into this work. And a really key thing that Amanda has helped us be very strategic about is that there are some very uh, easy to implement projects that we can tackle right away in the first two years to really show wins and to bro easily draw the community into what public art means and, and to not spend a lot of money necessarily. Uh, that ranges everything from, I know, a, a new project that's on the table with the garage and how we might uh, 
animate that through a mural as in the current rendering. Uh, and, and there are any number of projects that could easily be implemented in these first two years. Once we're up and running and, and everything is settled and the commission has had time to live with itself, the next step, of course, is to start leveraging the city's funds into more funding. And that's one of the critical elements of funding from a city for this type of project is that it immediately allows us to attract other grants and other private funds to make more of that 50000 And that's not unlike what we're doing right now with the Arts Energy Project, where we started with 50 from the NEA, 50 from the city, and raising an additional 50 from the community. So by year two, we fully expect to be, uh, have awareness of those opportunities and acting on them. And a really critical thing happened in this process that I didn't expect. We started talking about how art lives, or how we want art to live in Montpelier, and the notion about a broader cultural plan for Montpelier came up in almost every one of these workshops. And I want to be really clear that this, what's in front of you is not a cultural plan. It is a public art plan. It is a plan to invest in the infrastructure of Montpelier that helps define our city. There's a much broader discussion here around what we want our cultural uh, scape to be. And that would be developed through a cultural plan. And we're suggesting that the Public Art Commission would be the launching pad for that plan in the years three to five, which would take our aspirations to a new level around how culture lives in Montpelier. I'm not going to talk much about the long range plans because five years is eons away. But basically, as this grows, we're looking at large scale works. How can we understand how to manage those, where the funding comes from, and start implementing some really iconic pieces in uh, years five, five on. Great. I'm going to pause um, well, and invite questions. Yeah, great. Questions from the council. I'm just really, yeah. really excited about this, like incredibly so. <laughs> Thank you. Don't. We are too. And that you did so well in the booklet in reflecting the work. It's just beautiful and inspiring. It's very good. And I do appreciate, Paul, that you brought up the cultural plan because people ask me about that and it is different. And so that's good. And I, we talked a little bit when we met, Paul, about the art on the garage and whether that would go under this art commission and would that be our first expenditure towards, quote, 50,000. So just want to bring that up too. Right, and I, I failed to mention that there, there's that obvious possible revenue source. If, if the garage goes forward and as the rendering has it, there's uh, funding out of that budget to pull into this 50000 Also, I want to thank uh, Montpelier Alive for their work on this project. Uh, uh, Dan sits on the executive team, and we, through lots of conversations with them, uh, they've agreed to commit 5,000 of their DID funds each year into the $50,000 pool. They're currently uh, using the 5,000 for art projects uh, through their design committee, so it made sense that all of those funds be consolidated here. So thanks, thanks to Montpelier Alive. Um, and of course, uh, they'll have a designated seat on the Arts Commission. There are three de designated seats, one for VCFA, one for Montpelier Alive, and one from the economic development um, arm or economic development corporation. corporation, and then four at large members. Okay. Great. Further questions? Yeah. Now, I, I, I would just thank you so much for taking the time to meet with each of us individually. I think that allowed us to <coughs> do a deeper dive here. And as we look at some of the bigger projects um, we're moving forward on, I, I think we're at risk of it taking on kind of a sterile feel if it's not accompanied by a very vibrant like arts project like this here. Uh, so this, this is key as far as our future goals and really appreciate it. Go ahead, Glenn. Um, I was also very pleased to, to talk with you about this and I'm really excited about the, the uh, prospects for, for the, the plan. Um, I am also curious to know Maybe it's somewhere in here that I that I didn't catch, but uh, I'm I'm curious to know how much excitement you've encountered uh, uh, informally about who might be interested on in being on a, a public art commission. Are, are there people who have said, if it exists, I want to be on the list? Yes. Yeah. And I I, I uh, can tell you without 
without particularly naming names. Yeah, no need. Uh, but uh, Mont Montpelier is extraordinarily rich in expertise around art and public art. And uh, Nathan, for instance, uh, we can we can name Nathan because he's here and he's, he's been right so there. involved in his uh, prior role as executive director of the Helen Day Art Center. Uh, is experienced in commissioning art and he helped us. We have uh, a resident in town who works for the State Department and travels all over the world uh, repairing the U.S.'s art that lives in embassies. And he lives a couple houses down from me. Uh, we have residents in town who curate galleries in other communities. So there's going to be no problem. I think we're going to have really a rich pool to draw from of experience and, and skilled people. And probably a tough decision for all of you to just pick for. <laughs> So I'm very excited about this as well. I think um, this plan is just, it's so exciting. It's, um, there's so many great ideas in here. Um, so uh, you know, I'm excited to create the commission. I think that's going to be easy. <laughs> that's probably the, of all of the things, it's probably going to be the easiest uh, part. But then, um, and you and I have had this conversation. And so I just want to, uh, I'm sure maybe you've had this conversation uh, amongst yourselves as well. But um, just so everybody knows what I, what I was um, thinking about this in terms of money, um, and we're not going to be making any decisions tonight. Um, that's this is a part of the the budgeting process that we'll be uh, having over the next couple of months. But um, one of the things that I um, am interested in is uh, having some kind of a plan for the money as we um, move forward. And I know that's maybe not necessarily normal in lots of other places, but what I have learned is that there seems to be no normal. Um, and that, uh, I mean, my, I just want you to know, my preference would be um, that just like any other committee or, um, you know, like DID money or uh, even for uh, the um, Montpelier Development Corporation, they come to us with a budget to say, here's what we intend to spend money on this year. And that's something that I hope that, um, you know, ev when, you know, when you come to us for money, I mean, maybe it's 50000 every year, um, but even if it's just 50000 every year, that's fine. Um, but uh, having some plan of, like, this is what we intend to use it for, even if it's we intend to bank it because we want to do this big thing. Um, I just want to know what the plan is. Um, and I, I mean, sort of similar, there's a lot of parallels, parallels there with like the housing trust fund. You know, they have some certain things that they will say, you know, we, we, we're going to be spending this much on, uh, uh, you know, first time home buyers program, but, you know, we're going to be saving up and there are these big projects that we uh, want to do. So, um, and that, may, I'm not sure how that works with the first iteration. Uh, but especially if the garage passes, there is kind of an obvious first project that we'll need to do. But what were you, you going to say? If it's okay to respond, yeah. I think uh, it's a great point in terms of the, the public trust and public funds. Um, it, it might be useful to look at the process that went into the One Taylor Street project and that commission as a, as a pilot and a uh, trust building exercise. <laughs> Uh, between the between the public and what is possible with public engagement, and I think that I don't think anybody sitting here in this room would wish to jump over good process. To de I could deliver a budget to you tomorrow, but it wouldn't include the voices of mm -hmm. the yet to be formed commission. Yep. So that would be cart before the horse. Um, so it, I would argue that it might be an exercise in trust the first year. Yeah, um, and then to pile on because you've given me the mic. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are so many wonderful things that a city must do. Sidewalks, roads, water, um, unglamorous, absolutely essential, and extraordinarily expensive, right? Infrastructure is not cheap. Um, in that context, this really minor investment has the potential to pole vault this city over and over again to be a leader in this state and in New England as a destination for arts and culture. And um, you look at the, the sort of multiplier on dollars spent on arts and culture, especially public dollars, and it's really tremendous. And so I, um, I, imp uh, I encourage, <laughs> I encourage the leadership to consider that strongly. Uh, look at the one Taylor Street pilot as a as an example, and. Um, 
have the faith and courage to back that with a fifty thousand dollar investment the first year and let's keep let's keep being unique let's keep being better than what we are now and better than our neighbors because we want to be special amanda do you want to talk for a minute about that yeah i also um in anticipation of this question on page 58 there actually is a requirement for the commission to do a public art work plan and Great. that allows the commission to understand what their budget will be and when they come to you and ask they're going to have kind of a kind of a plan um, essentially the artist is who decides what the art is but you can see on page 58 the following steps are going to be taken so they understand how much funding is available they're going to identify which projects are going to be paid for by the funding that's going to be put forth and then they're going to develop a work plan that includes locations goals and budgets for each of the public art projects that they're going Great. to so that's thank it. you so much You're i welcome. so appreciate that yes <laughs> excellent uh, jack um i in thinking about this project, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, this year is the 30th anniversary of Lost Nation being upstairs in, in City Hall. And it was a pretty big investment of money to uh, be able to improve the space so, this, uh, so the theater could work there. Um, <clears throat> but I don't think anyone would question that has been a tremendous benefit to the city. And Paul, you said to me this morning, well, has anyone ever asked someone to visit Montpelier uh, for the art. And I can say my in-laws typically come up here to visit us every fall, and they usually try to time it so they're coming at the time when they're, they can see a show at Lost Nation. Um, and so I think this is great. Obviously, the budget process is what it is. And so uh, supporting this now doesn't mean Yes, I'm definitely on board for $50,000 in this year's budget, but um, I, I strongly support this, and I think this is a great job. Glenn. Um, I want to say that personally, at least, uh, I will be going hard for $50,000 in the, the budget, and I also I want to, to, I've been thinking about this a little bit over the last few days. I, I am comfortable, especially with the, the work plan uh, that you just des described, with the idea of um, if we adopt this plan, seeding it with the money that will make it function uh, as much as possible. Um, I'm also just curious, uh, and I don't know if this is the place to, to, to go through it quickly, but, but in terms of uh, scheduling, assuming we, we were to adopt the, the, the plan tonight, we can presumably go right ahead and advertise for members, uh, and the commission could be formed very shortly, I imagine, and uh, their first directive could be to scramble a budget as fast as possible. Uh, what's... <laughs> uh, I want to jump yeah. in here, <laughs> um, although I appreciate what, where you're going with this, Glenn, and... I no, mean, you're me corner off, kind of <laughs> theoretically, uh, but uh, the manager in me uh, yes. wants to yeah. uh, rear what, its ugly what, head and what's say... What's the realism then? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, what, what we're really... It, this is the, definitely a cart before the horse uh, issue, but uh, what the council can hold on to here is that this plan, created by one of the country's leading consultants in public art, is best practice. This has been vetted by, uh, for instance, members of the advisory team include Michelle Bailey, who is here tonight, who runs the public art program for the state through the Vermont Arts Council. Uh, David Sheets was on the advisory team. He has also seen this plan and been heavily involved. This is as good an assurance that you will ever get that this process will work and we will come out with community engaged and inspiring work. There is a leap the first year because of the timeline. In order for this to function, we need to be doing everything at once the first year. But we won't be able to deliver a budget and a project plan in time for you to get through the, the, the holiday season, you know. Before. Right, and for our budget cycle. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. just, just I wanted to. Perfectly reasonable. <laughs> I, I'm, and and I'm, thanks for throwing that out there. I appreciate it. Uh, Tana. Well, I agree with you on the timeline, but you've given us the essence to leap. I mean, there isn't a whole lot we have to trust. So much is laid out here. So yeah. I think we'll find some money. Okay. 
All right. Uh, need a motion? I think we need a motion. I will make the motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Glenn. No, go please. Ahead. No, no, no. no. Go, go. Okay. I, I move <laughs> that we adopt the public art master plan uh, as presented tonight. Uh, Funding decisions pending our budget process. Don't even, Don't even need that part. Okay, I move. I will second strike that. that. Thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just so excited. I might know. you? <laughs> so, as a part of that, might you also want to create the commission? Yes, I move that we create the commission. That's <laughs> okay, yeah. and that's okay with you. Oh, maybe Donna or can Donna. second that one. If you're adopting the plan, it says you're going to adopting the plan. So that's maybe an understood to be a part of it. Okay, I just want to be really clear. Okay, great. Uh, so we're adopting the plan. Great. Um, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. So it's understood then. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And and just so, one, yeah. one last. This is Amanda's last visit to Montpelier for this project. For this project. For I'll this be project. Back. I want to just extend a huge thank you and recognition <laughs> to the extraordinary work she has done in leading us and advising us in creating something that we can all be proud of. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank likewise you. to Paul. Congratulations. Great, so we'll be advertising for those seats. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Everybody, please leave your copies. Okay. Take a look and pass them on. All right, the downtown improvement district. Um, team, do we need a, yes. a break? Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys you were so on the ball. Just getting right up here, too. We're going to take a five-minute break. Okay. Okay, so we're back from our five-minute break. Um, all right, well, I'll turn it over to you all. Okay. Uh, Dan Groberg, I'm the executive director of Montpelier Live. David Marco, board president of Montpelier Live. Uh, so we are here tonight to um, review our activities with the Downtown Improvement District and present a, a proposed plan for FY19. So that's actually the year we're in currently. We're a little behind on the uh, eight ball uh, due to when I started the position and when we were able to get the schedule. So um, the, the Downtown Improvement District, as you know, is a special assessment on commercial property within the de uh, a designated area of the downtown. Uh, Montpelier Alive controls the spending of the budget with city uh, council approval. Um, we do not get any administrative fee or anything for managing the funds. Um, they certainly supplement a lot of our activities, but also require effort on our behalf to expend them. So I'll just make that point. Um, before I go any further, I do want to clarify quickly um, what you heard from the public art uh, plan, which is that um, starting in FY20, that we plan to propose that there is $5,000 included that would go towards the public RE. Um, we obviously can't commit that because the council needs to approve that. And also just wanted to clarify that you will not see that in the documents tonight because tonight we're talking about FY19, not FY20. So just wanted to clarify that before we went any further. Um, so we're here, yeah, for two reasons tonight. One is to review um, that what we've been doing with the Downtown Improvement District Funds last year uh, to present uh, a proposed plan for FY19, um, and also to talk uh, briefly about the uh, Montpelier Alive uh, appropriation, which is separate, separate. from the DID. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to walk you through the report, the uh, paper point, if you will. I don't have a path. Um, so uh, we sort of break the <coughs> activities into three uh, primary areas, uh, advertising and marketing, uh, downtown design, and our arts and events grants. So the advertising and marketing um, in the FY18 uh, plan that was approved by council was about $33,800, a little bit more than half of the total funds available from the DID, which is just under $60,000. Um, that's split into three uh, primary purposes. Uh, one is in-state advertising, uh, sorry, four purposes. One is in-state advertising, one is out-of-state advertising, one is printed materials or materials generally, and one is the uh, website, which is, uh, uh, serves as the Montpelier Live website, but is also a very tourism-focused website towards visitors to Montpelier. Um, the in-state advertising is um, 
as it sounds, focus on attracting in-state visitors, so people from Washington County and around Vermont to come visit for all of our events. Um, almost all of that money goes towards direct advertising, uh, radio, print, social media, um, including advertising various events that are happening in Montpelier, uh, like Moonlight Madness, etc. Um, they uh, also, um, I'm passing around some materials, you'll see um, one of those pieces is an ad that appears in Best of Central Vermont Magazine. That's something that we do advertising in. Um, the World has various seasonal guides. The Times Argus has various seasonal guides uh, promoting the various events that are happening in Montpelier. Um, we've also used these funds um, to advertise new businesses that have opened in Montpelier um, and work with them on some like grand opening activities. Um, you may have been at the Onion River. I know the mayor was at the Onion River Outdoors and Rome grand opening event. Uh, a portion of the funds go to out-of-state advertising. Um, the, we work with the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing because they have a match program where they will match one-to-one -one, um, up to $10,000 of funds that go through them. Um, they also have tremendous buying power because they are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on marketing of Vermont. So they have um, you know, bulk rates in various papers, et cetera. Um, so some of the things that we've spent the money on this last year, um, and I'll just say that we've spent um, only a small portion of that because we're uh, targeting a lot of that towards this coming year. Um, we spent money on the uh, discovery map, which is the tourist map that you see everyone walking around with, um, to point people towards the website so they can learn about events and restaurants and things that may not be on the map itself. Uh, we've done um, Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising. We've done advertising through Waze, which is a mapping service. So actually, as you drive past Montpelier, it will suggest that you stop in Montpelier. Uh, which, and actually, we've had thousands of actions taken on that for a very little amount of money. So it's really reaching people at the point of decision, like, should I stop in Montpelier, uh, which is exciting. Um, and then uh, the Boston Herald article, which is circulating, and there's a picture of right here. Uh, this is something we do a lot of called advertorial content, uh, where um, we're essentially paying for a article to be written um, about Montpelier. Uh, we get to choose sort of the theme. They have a writer that interviews you know, people about it, and they actually write the article. Um, but the theme of this article that appeared uh, on September 6th in the Boston Herald and also had a digital campaign with 100,000 impressions of the theme was sort of Montpelier as your base camp for central Vermont adventures. So stay and eat in Montpelier and also enjoy the things in Montpelier and the surrounding towns, um, sort of acknowledging uh, this more regional approach that we're trying to take where people are not going to spend 100% of their time and money in Montpelier, but hopefully they'll stay in Montpelier and dine in Montpelier. Uh, the materials. Uh, Similarly, we're reserving a big portion of the materials funds for a project that I'll talk about briefly. Um, but what we have spent it on uh, last year was the series on a stick campaign, which hopefully you've seen, which is kind of a whimsical way to acknowledge that series was not on the State House. We worked with the friends of the State House on this project uh, to hand out these fun little paper series that you could take on your travels and take pictures and post them on social media. It was really engaging. People had fun with it. Uh, people took pictures of, of, of series uh, at the Berlin Wall, um, at the Leaning Tower of Pisa, um, all over the world, actually. Um, and they all have a downtown Montpelier logo on them and a hashtag that people were using. Um, we also spent funds on the street light pole banners, which are at DPW now waiting to be installed. So um, hopefully that will happen soon. Um, money is spent on the website. We've done a lot of work on the website. I hope that some of you have looked at it recently. Um, it is now up to date, which is the first step, but also developed a lot of new content for it, um, a series of itineraries for different interests. So we've um, now launched three of those, one for beer lovers. It's like 36 hours in Montpelier for beer lovers, one for art lovers, one for history lovers that have been done. Um, so they're curated by experts in the area. So the arts one was done by Ginny Callen, the director of the T.W. Wood Gallery. The beer one was done by the manager at Three Penny Tap Room. Uh, the history one was done by the outreach person at the Vermont Historical Society. So they're really um, 
quite nice pieces. Um, we also have been doing sort of seasonal things like what to do in spring, what to do in uh, summer, um, and uh, hidden treasures, um, getting a lot of public input on it, which has raised a lot of great um, engagement. Um, and we've been improving the business directory and launching um, photo. We've had professional photos taken um, in a lot of the retail stores downtown and launched a really nice directory of businesses with uh, beautiful listings that show what it's like to be inside the store. Um, done some interviews with some store owners. Um, we also launched a weekly email newsletter, which I hope you subscribe to, called Vermont Served Daily, which is sort of our brand tagline. Um, every week, it has some feature items and also the top five events coming up this week. Um, it's a great way to showcase not only what Montpelier Live is doing, but all the other wonderful things happening in town. Um, and the, some of the DID funds support the costs of the email marketing client. Uh, we have about 2,500 people on our email list, but actually we're in the middle of a campaign with uh, the state that will add another 5,000 emails to our email list um, at basically zero cost to us. We did a giveaway contest where the Capitol Plaza contributed a three-night stay, and we have $700 in downtown shopping gift certificates that were all donated, um, and 5,000 people have entered that contest. Um, we spent maybe $100 uh, promoting it. Actually, the state spent $2,000 on uh, social media promotion for that campaign. Um, at no cost to us. Um, we get to keep the emails, they get to keep the emails, and in the process people learned about Montpelier, so it was really nice. Um, the second, stop me if you have any questions, I, I'm going fast for your sake. Um, Fine. <laughs> the second category, uh, which is about $20,000, is downtown design. That consists of uh, wayfinding signage, holiday decorations, flower planting and maintenance, and streetscape. Wayfinding signage were funds to pay the consultant to continue the plan. Um, the holiday decorations you will see coming mid-November to downtown, um, but these funds were for last year's decorations, but we get garland to wrap all the light poles, wreaths, lights, etc. cetera. Um, plantings and maintenance, all the flower barrels and baskets downtown. Uh, we spent a lot of money doing a new landscape um, plan. The plan itself was donated by Dee Dee Brush, but getting a lot of flowers for City Hall Plaza and planting those this year. Um, also, the um, yeah watering. Can I ask you a question yes, about that? Please. Does that include Langdon Street Bridge? The Langdon Street Bridge itself, it does not include. No. Okay. No, it does not include. Um, and then $2,000 for Streetscape this year, uh, we purchased three sets of new metal trash cans to replace the ugly plastic trash cans. Uh, so there are still nine sets to go. So uh, <laughs> that is a work in progress. Um, and then the final piece is the Community <coughs> Arts and Events Grants. Um, so this is really about leveraging Montpelier Live's uh, promotions and expertise and um, adding funding to events uh, that take place downtown to really make those events great. Um, so we funded four projects uh, in this year. It's a public grant application that we make available. Uh, one of the projects actually was canceled and the funds have been refunded and we plan to re um, give them out next year, so to speak. Um, but the other three projects, uh, Spice on Snow, a series of community art workshops by the Art Resource Association, and then Abundant Silence uh, during the last Art Walk did a public concert in front of the Senior Center that was very well attended. Um, so that's what we spent the money on last year, essentially. Um, and I will note as we look towards what we plan to spend next year is that um, First of all, our fiscal year, Bump Hill Your Lives fiscal year, does not line up with the city's fiscal year. We're on a calendar fiscal year. Um, and the second piece is that sometimes we sort of bank funds to spend on bigger projects that we anticipate coming. Um, so this proposed budget, you will see that there are some changes in sort of how we're spending the money versus last year. Uh, the biggest is that we're spending, proposing to spend only $2,500 on materials. That's because we did not spend a majority of the funds from last year. There's about $8,000 in that materials line from last year's budget that has not been spent yet that we plan to roll over, so to speak. Um, the other sort of most significant change is, um, well, two of them. One is proposing to spend some money on photography and videography. We haven't had um, new photos taken in a couple years. We didn't do 
uh, July 3rd photos last year. Um, just have to keep that kind of stuff fresh for advertising because it's pretty obvious. People see like, oh, the coffee corner's not there anymore. Um, you know, so it's, we need to take new photos. We work with a local photographer, um, often with Paul Richardson, sometimes with John Snell. Um, and the other piece is wayfinding signage. So we're hoping that this is the last piece that finishes out the consultant um, and also brings us up to the $100,000 max that I've spoken about previously that's required uh, for the downtown transportation fund grant that we apply to in the spring. <coughs> so I'm happy to go through all of these or just take questions. Um, I will say that one of the things that I was passing around was the Discover Waterbury touristy pamphlet. Um, it went all the way around. It went all the way around. And we are proposing with the materials funds to do um, something similar for Montpelier. Even in the electronic era, these are very popular, especially with a certain uh, demographic. Um, Waterbury printed 20,000 of them, planning on them lasting for two years. And actually, they ran out early. Um, we would distribute them at state welcome centers, at various other tourist-friendly locations. Um, that's, that's the gist. Uh, I'm happy to dive into any of the categories or any questions, if anyone has any. Comes or questions? Okay, I, I have a couple. Um, one is, I mean, I know I just asked this question about, like, oh, did, did this include, you know, funding for the Lane Street Bridge? And that's, you know, fine, it didn't. Um, at, at some point, you know, we... Um, I would like for the city to figure out like how we might go about uh, maintaining uh, so the plantings that are on the Langer Street Bridge. I think they're a great asset. They're really beautiful, and um, whether that means that we incorporate it into the city budget as just a contracted item, and then we can um, maybe work together with Montpelier Live to to add it on to the contract that you already have um, with the the person who maintains them or if it's something separate that we do, or if it's just incorporated into the parks budget. Um, we just, I think we need to figure that out, but I just want to flag that as a Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll just say that we're, we're happy to work with Langdon Street Alive. We asked them for a specific request for mm -hmm. funds and did not receive one, and we didn't feel comfortable just it's handing fine. out city funds without having a specific nope, request for Nope, that's fair. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to work on figuring that out. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that, uh, uh, well, I love all the graphs. They make me very happy. Um, and particularly with the metrics, I mean, one of the things that we're, we spend a lot of money on um, with this is advertising and marketing. And so, uh, you know, having the statistics about how effective um, that marketing is, I find um, really helpful. And I think it's, uh, you know, good to know, like, what what's, um, you know, a good use of our uh, advertising dollars, like what's the most effective yeah. mechanisms. Um, Sometimes the advertising is going to be more measurable than other times. Um, sometimes it's about establishing the brand so that it's sort of in the back of somebody's head. Mm -hmm. um, oh, like, I want to plan a trip this weekend. Didn't I see something about that cool town in Vermont? Um, you know, you, it may be months later that there's an uh, impact. It's not necessarily measurable. Obviously, things that we do online, you have things like impressions mm -hmm. and click-through rates. and. Things like that. Um, one question: uh, There was an abbreviation in the key engagement metrics for, that's uh, Y O Y. Year over year. Year over year. So, what did can you explain that? Um, I'm not sure which specifically you're referring to. Oh, that's so the increase um, from. So it's like six six point three percent increase from the previous Correct. year. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, you know, as you were describing some other metrics, uh, you know, like the the decisions that people make uh, over the Waze app. You know, that's those are that's. I mean, I know um, that might be a small thing, but it's it's a indicator for us that, like, again, we're spending our money well. And anyway, so that's that. That's another thing that you know, as we you know, think through, like, how do we report out? And in, in part, like, this is kind of. I'm trying to think if like there's another time when you all report out to us. The, we're asked to present once a year. Once a year. That's not this time. That is this time. That okay. is this time. And right. Okay. So <laughs> it is this time. So I mean that. Well, yeah. I'm happy to present as often <laughs> as you like. <laughs> <me to. laughs> no, once is it's fine. <laughs> um, but but having anyway as all, all that data you know that says that like 
this was this was worth our money, and this is what the effect is of um, uh, as much as there are measurable effects. You know, yeah, it's great. And it's we, great. Um, as often as possible, try and leverage Montpelier Live funds or resources when we're doing these yeah. things. So um, you know, we spent money marketing uh, Moonlight Madness, so that was advertising money that was from the DID, but it was mm -hmm. uh, funds, program funds from Montpelier Live that supported all the musicians and performers downtown. Um, so there's a nice synergy there. Well, great. Donna. I'm a little confused. Would you explain the Langdon Street Alive? I thought it was, you were shared. I mean, you see no. Langdon Street they totally separate because they did a special thing in the summer? Um, Langdon Street Alive is its own organization that just stole our name, <laughs> 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 that borrowed our, our wording um, from our name. They are a separate organization from us, um, and they were, um, we provided them with the opportunity to apply for one of the Downtown Arts and Events grants, and they did not apply for one of those grants. Um, and then um, when there was a uh, email that circulated, I'm not sure if the whole council got it or just the mayor, um, from uh, Langdon Street Alive um, asking for funding for uh, the plantings. Uh, we, um, we found volunteers for Langdon Street Alive to water the plants. That was one of the concerns that they had is about um, the watering and could they use our waterers. Our, uh, we found two volunteers for, to water the plants for them. Um, they had also asked for funding, so we asked for a specific proposal of how it would be spent, and we did not receive that. So if I wanted to see lights on Langdon Street Bridge, I have to go to this other organization? No, well, there will be holiday lights on Langdon Street Bridge this year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good way of giving you what you want and not answering your question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Further questions? Okay. So I think, we, uh, yes? Go ahead. Well, I know this is uh, an appropriation request, so I'm just wondering, well, we're out of the regular budget cycle, so what does this mean? How do we do this? Was this money already in the budget the voters uh, passed, but it yeah. but it hasn't been appropriated because it, we haven't had the request yet? Or well, so the funds, yeah, um, so the taxpayers specifically approved the downtown improvement um, budget. Uh, uh, tax yeah. mm -hmm. assessment. Um, so the funds have been raised by the taxpayers, um, and then I, they, I can't tell you whether because I've lost track of what was last year's money versus this year's money. But um, the city pays in two installments to Montpelier Live. Um, there was an agreement several years ago that Montpelier Live would manage the funds, um, and what we are tasked with by that agreement several years ago is to. Uh, outline a specific plan for how the funds would be expended to City Council, and that is the plan that is being presented today that needs to be approved by the Council. So this is not a part of our regular budget. Correct. Which is why, you know, we can, I, I would feel okay about, you know, approving this tonight because it's not, it's separate. But it's in city funds that have already been right. raised and passed by the voters. Yes. Thank you. Clear? No? I, yes. I have, and I know the FY year and calendar year. So I would assume what we allocated and the voters allocated for FY19, you're now spending in your 2019 year. But is that we, not true? We have um, not spent any of funds from FY19 yet. Um, for one, we had, uh, because I only came into this position six months into the FY, and there was six months without a director, in the FY18 appropriation, there were funds that weren't yet expended. So I was spending funds that had already been approved by City Council for FY18. Um, so there have not been FY19 funds spent yet. So that's why I. So when they vote for FY20 for the city budget. Yes that would become your FY money, I mean, your 2020 money. Correct, which yeah. I would come back to in which is good hopefully in June next time or May as opposed and to October. And you know October, exactly yes. what they voted and you make your, and then you're able to make your Correct. budget out of it. That's good. Thank you. Great. Okay. Is there a motion? Yep. Go ahead, Connor. So I'll move to approve the downtown uh, improvement district budget for $59,960. Second. Further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great.
Thank you very Thank you. much. And then, well, I do briefly want to also discuss the Montpelier Live appropriation, which is so separate from the DID budget. Now we're talking about the general fund. Uh, Montpelier Life uh, receives some city funding. It's through the community enhancements line in the general fund budget. Um, Montpelier Live has received $22,600 since we were founded in 1999 every year. It has not increased. Uh, we pay $2,600 in rent and technology support back to the city, so it's functionally $20,000. Uh, we do also receive um, some specific funds for events, um, like the city sharing the security costs for July 3rd. Um, there's also a contribution towards our fall slash winter event, is how it's framed um, in the budget. It's been used for first night in the past. It's been used for Flannel Friday, other fall events. Um, but sort of the base support for Montpelier Live as an organization is that $22,600 minus our rent. Um, that uh, supports my salary and our general work. And like I said, it has not gone up since 1999. Um, and so I'll just talk briefly about how the work of Montpelier Life has changed. Um, we have uh, taken on some functions that the city may otherwise take on. I point actually to the DID budget as a prime example of that. Um, so even though we are able to expend those funds, which is a great support to us, it's also um, increased work for Montpelier Live. Um, we don't get an administrative fee or anything like that to manage the funds. Um, so, you know, we're administering this grant program, we're doing the plantings and blah, 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 that needs management. Um, and that amount hasn't changed. Um, also, obviously, costs go up for everything every year, um, including, you know, salaries. Um, and just generally, you know, advertising costs go up, the office supply costs go up, everything has gone up. Um, but the appropriation has not. Um, I think I'd like you to feel that high from Friday and Moonlight Madness again briefly, um, which is that the work that Montpelier Live does is really vital to Montpelier. Um, when you go downtown and you have that feeling that you're in a special place, that you may not realize it, but a lot of that is due to the work of Montpelier Live. It's the events that we create. It's the streetscape that's beautiful and has holiday decorations and plantings and flowers. It's supporting the downtown uh, businesses so that we have a thriving downtown with a low vacancy rate full of local stores and restaurants. Um, so I, again, I know that you can't, uh, you're not allocating any funds from the budget, you know, general fund budget tonight, but as you go forward into your budget process, um, we'd like to request uh, that the uh, allocation to Montpelier Life be increased by $10,000, uh, so from $22,600 to $32,600, uh, which um, I know is a large jump in one year percentage-wise, uh, but will hopefully make up for some lost time. Um, and then we would anticipate increasing, you know, to go along with inflation going forward. Um, but it would be sort of a catch-up uh, year. Um, there's also been some discussion, um, which is not finalized yet, of increasing the hours of the executive director position. Right now, it's only a 30-hour position. Um, if Even if that does not happen, it's likely that we'll need to um, have additional support, whether it's from paid interns or hiring outside contractors to help, um, because the work has only increased. The expectations and demands on our organization have increased, because um, everyone would like us to be doing everything, which, um, um, and uh, so I, I hope you'll consider that request going forward. Thank you. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't put in your DID budget administrative expenses. Is um, that something it, we won't let you do? It was specifically in the original guidelines from city council that it could not go towards any salaries. Hmm. So in order for you to do the ID D money, we have to give you money as a direct <laughs> I think we should review that. That's interesting. Yeah. Because to me, if you're going to, I mean, any grant, when you administrate it, there's administrative money. So I think sure. we need to review and, that. Uh, I, I acknowledge that. That's one option. I'd also just say, what out of the DID budget would you like to cut in exchange for the administrative? Oh, I can find some things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we won't go down there. <laughs> <laughs> All part of the conversation. All part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, further questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks and for your time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
Okay. All right, so um, Kate, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, Big crowd tonight. I know, right? <laughs> now, theoretically, we wean them out. <laughs> we uh, we were going to be also talking about the net zero um, resolution, also the energy efficiency update. Which would you like to talk about first? Um, maybe we'll take up the resolution first. Okay. And, and I can give a little background on the thing that you maybe just voted on in the consent agenda, yes. but um, <laughs> but give you a little background about what that's all about. And then um, the second piece is just to uh, Sue and Bill asked me to come in and give a little update um, specifically on our municipal working group and what we've been working on related to the energy audits and the revolving loan fund and kind of status of uh, city buildings. So, um, but first I'll just tell you why we put together this resolution. Basically, um, over the last year or more, um, you know, the original idea of the net zero Montpelier goal was adopted by City Council in 2014. Um, and, um, you know, as the chair of the Energy Advisory Committee, I don't know if I introduce myself, um, the, you know, as we've been going along, just kind of had a lot of discussion within our committee about like, well, what exactly is the goal? And went back through all the minutes to try and find what it said in the city council minutes. And it really didn't say anything specific about what, what it, how to define it. So we, um, we spent some time as a committee. We had a strategic planning retreat in June. Um, we, you know, took a few hours to really try and hash this out. And the main question point has been, you know, I think the overall, those of you who are, have been familiar with this idea of the net zero goal, it's net zero it, for, for Montpelier by 2030. And the question was, is that for the entire city, every, res, all, every residence, every business, um, all the municipal functions, all the transportation? Um, so kind of like the bigger definition would be like the whole community um, or a more refined definition would be um, just municipal buildings and functions. Um, and depending on who you talk to, there were different interpretations of what that goal was. Um, so we basically came, after a lot of discussion, um, came out with this the, kind of the second page of the, um, the resolution, but basically saying that we are committed to 100% um, renewable or offset for municipal government operations. So again, city buildings, city transportation, um, heating, electrical, um, but then pushing off the community-wide goal to 2050. Um, and that's more in alignment with the whole state's goals. There, the state's goal is 90% by 2050. So we would still be stretching and reaching a little bit further than that. Um, the other distinction being that the 2030 goal has the option of doing offsets. So if there are certain areas where we can't get to 100% renewable, like say in you know, the fuel for our heavy equipment or something like that, then we could potentially use uh, purchase offsets to, to be able to say we got to 100% mm -hmm. net zero. Um, but we didn't allow that option in the 2050 version. So we have more time. Um, so that was really the purpose of this was to get this on paper, get it in the record as this is how we're defining our goal. Um, and then the three directions basically at the bottom um, talk about how we are asking city staff and, the, and all the different city departments to be part of this process. Um, so basically asking each city department to identify opportunities to align their policies, procedures, and practices with the goal and to report on it annually. Um, what we'd really like to be able to do is have a little section in the annual report um, that goes through different departments and, and helps, you know, kind of nudge the departments to identify um, what they're doing and what they could be doing. Um, we recommend that, uh, this recommends that city staff develop a 10-year plan, um, basically how do we get to this 2030 goal? Um, what are the actions? And, and this would be in addition to the overall energy plan that will be part of the, the city plan that the planning department or planning commission is working on. Um, and then the third piece was directing the planning commission to just review the zoning bylaws and the new city plan 
to make sure that it's in alignment um, with these net zero goals. So does anyone have questions about the resolution? Okay. Um, I would just like to highlight that um, I love this, uh, <laughs> but my highlight is more uh, in terms of the parking garage. Um, and I guess it just seems to be an interesting juxtaposition that we're talking about, um, you know, sort of by 2030, 100% of our city will be, uh, you know, net net zero, and we can do offsets if we need to, uh, but that we're, you know, contemplating spending $10.5 million on, in essence, fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, and, and so I just want the council to be mindful that we're sort of talking out of both sides. Okay, well, I voted no, but <laughs> um, I think it's important that we're mindful that, that this is sort of in opposite with, with that in a lot of ways. So I'm so. going to, oh, sorry, I want to cut you off. I would actually disagree, and the reason is because... Uh, uh, it's very likely that no single solution is going to exist in terms of transportation for everybody. And uh, a very real part of my vision for the future of transportation in Montpelier uh, includes a substantial number of electric vehicles. In fact, um, there's probably going to be a lot of, uh, I, I hope, autonomous electric vehicles. And they will need to charge somewhere during the day. And we're already planning for there to be electric vehicle charging stations in this facility. And my hope is that uh, we can, as that, as that demand increases, that we can expand the number of electric vehicle charging stations in that, in that area. And then we can be removing parking from elsewhere in the city, particularly that does n is not equipped to uh, provide that kind of um, charging infrastructure. So any other, <laughs> other questions or comments other about the resolution? About the resolution. Matt, I can. Uh, yeah. I was really glad for the last page. It was a bit long. <laughs> but the last page really got very specific. And thank you for that. I think we probably do need to actually vote on this. We, okay. I, well, we did. It was, it was in, in the, the, it was in the <laughs> consent agenda. Okay. Consent agenda. Okay. Yeah, great. I'm not sure that it was abundantly clear, but great. <laughs> I, if it was clear to you. You it made was. the motion to move it, it to a consent to agenda. agenda. In. Yeah. I thought I added the the street closure. Nope. Both of them. Okay. Great. We're gonna great then. You did it well. That's it's fantastic. <laughs> it's already been approved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yes. We appreciate okay. it. Um, <laughs> as long as everyone agrees. All right. I'll move again. Get it in the record. <laughs> um, so basically, in terms of the the municipal buildings update, I wanted to uh, kind of go back over the last two years to get everyone up to speed as to kind of w what we've been doing and how we got to this point and then it kind of explains where we're going next. Um, so two years ago, September 2016, um, the council approved the net zero revolving loan fund um, and that was taking $20,000 out of the general reserve fund and allocating it specifically for municipal energy efficiency projects in a revolving loan fund that will, so as savings are accrued by these energy savings projects, it goes back into the fund and grows over time. Um, so we started with $20,000, we got a $5,000 um, kind of match from Efficiency Vermont. Um, and then we basically, once that <coughs> happened, we were like, okay, we gotta figure out the system, we've gotta put a committee together. So we actually have a, a subcommittee that involves three city staff and three members of MIAC. Um, and we worked with this group called SEI, the Sustainable Endowments Institute. So they have this whole, they support organizations, mostly um, institutions of higher ed, in, in setting up these funds. So we've got, you know, our, our application and we've got our guidelines and we put all those materials together. And we did a first pilot project in 2017, which was a relatively small one. It's a capacitor at the water treatment plant, not very sexy, Basically, it doesn't actually save energy, but it saves money because it reduces peak demand charges. So it saves us about 100 bucks a month, and we've already, we, we spent the money, it's already paid itself back. Um, in, and it was a good, like, small test of the system. Um, and so once it's paid back, then we take 50% of the savings for the next two years, and that helps kind of build the fund up over time. Um, but after we, you know, after we got the fund established, we were like, okay, so how do we figure out these projects? Anyone can bring a project to the committee, they can fill out the application, but um, how do we kind of not just pick like the lowest hanging fruit, but the, 
things that are going to have the most impact. And we realized that the, we hadn't done building energy audits of the city's municipal buildings for the most part that we could find. Um, we found a, we found one for the rec center, um, but that was the only one that anyone could put their hands on. So we came back to council and said we would like twenty thousand dollars to hire consulting engineers to do level two energy audits of municipal buildings. We picked six to start with. That's the six biggest and biggest users. Um, we had to put that out to bid, so it wasn't until December of last year that we actually completed the audits. Um, the six buildings that we did were uh, City Hall, Fire Station, Police Station, the um, Water Resource Recovery Facility Office, the Water Treatment Plant, and DPW Office. Um, and so out of those reports, they, um, and you got that in the packet for tonight's meeting, but um, it, it's, it's a long report, so I can understand if you did not read the whole thing, but it basically goes through envelope improvements, so, you know, how to do air sealing and insulation, and then electrical improvements for lighting and some process stuff. <clears throat> um, and so we got this nice spreadsheet of probably like 60 or 70 different individual initiatives or what they call recommended measures and we can look at it by building or by type and you know sort it lots of different ways if you put all the recommended things together it's about four hundred thousand dollars worth of work um <laughs> so so then we kind of said okay great let's go through <laughs> this process and and do a little cherry picking of figuring out what are the things that we could do that would have the most impact that we could do with the revolving loan money that we have available um and part of the revolving load guidelines say that you have to have a payback period of four years or less. So we were really looking at payback period and which are the, which are the things that, that we could do that are you know, in the five to $10,000 range and, and pick those. So then we said, well, before we go out and subcontract these you know, projects that are on these recommended lists, we should really go talk to the city staff who run these buildings and make sure that these recommended measures make sense to them. Um, so we spent most of the spring and summer kind of trying to track down like who's really in charge of each building, not always totally clear, um, and try and get a meeting with them and say, okay, here's the audit report. Um, do you agree with these ideas? And here are the things that we <coughs> thought maybe the revolving loan fund could, could work on or could fund for you. Does that make sense? Um, and not all the things made sense. So there's a lot of going back and forth to the list of like, okay, you know, the, the list says this, but what we really want to do is this. So, um, so that took longer than we expected, I think. Um, but we finally, in the last couple months, have been working with Steve Twombly um, to go out and get bids for some of these projects. So there are three projects that we have now approved to fund with the revolving loan fund. Um, one is new interior storms at the DPW office, about 1600 bucks. Um, one is going through all of the windows here in City Hall, which there's 150 windows in this building. Um, and going through and checking the weather stripping and adjusting things, and they're about halfway through that process. Um, and it, it takes a while because it has to be done sometimes after hours and on the weekends. And um, But that's... And then there are also a couple interior storms that are getting replaced in here. And then upstairs in the theater, um, we'll be doing a LED lighting replacement for the house lights of the theater, which is another five grand, more or less. Um, so those are the projects that have now been approved as of two weeks ago or something when we met and are in progress. Um, and we are also getting quotes for replacing dehumidifier at the water treatment plant um, but we haven't heard back from that contractor yet so kind of if that's a reasonable amount we may go forward with that but um, so we haven't spent all of the revolving loan fund money yet um, we've committed 13,000 out of the 25,000 that we have in there right now um, so I think the bigger picture um, thing to say is like yeah it takes take some effort to like get all these projects lined up hopefully someday when we have a energy and facilities coordinator on staff this would be part of their job um, 
even just like coming up with this took me a long time to try and track all this stuff down. Um, the other piece that came out of the energy audits um, that some of you have heard me talk about before is this thing called retro commissioning. And so what retro commissioning is, is you go into an existing building and look at the existing systems for heating, ventilation, um, air conditioning, cooling. And basically it's like engineers going in and just like going, to, taking a deep dive into all of the systems and figuring out how is it working? Are the controls set up properly? Can, we, can they be tweaked or be made more efficient? It doesn't look at replacement or you know, switching out fuels or things like that, but it just looks at like, is it working properly and what can we do? So the, luckily Efficiency Vermont has a program where they will cover the first $5,000 of that process. Um, we brought them in and worked with, um, use the Efficiency Vermont money to hire CX associates last year to do retro commissioning at the police station, um, which was a huge success. We discovered the issue that had caused the doubling of their heating load. Um, it was a $20 fan switch. Um, and by fixing the fan switch, we have saved $14,000 a year. Um, so big success story. And out of the audits, they, they included, they said there are three areas that they recommended we do the retro commissioning on. Um, and since, it's been, since that initial process has been free through Efficiency Vermont, we said, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Um, so over the summer, we did three more retro commissioning studies. One was looking at the district heat loop in the summer. So how it works down in the basement of City Hall and um, opportunities for improving the efficiency of that. Another one looked at the fire station. It has a snow melting system. So basically there is a heating loop that keeps the concrete warm so that snow doesn't build up in front of the fire station doors. So they looked at that. Um, and then they also looked at the water treatment plant and the dehumidifiers and um, some of the stuff over there. So we just got those reports back in the last, one of them came in today. Um, and there, none of them were like big aha moments, not as exciting or big opportunities like at the police station, but there are definitely some pieces that we can follow up with on those. And there may be a few projects out of that that we can fund through the revolving loan fund. Um, so I'm not gonna go through everything we've done, but I just, I did send around very belatedly this list of like what's been completed for each of the buildings, what's in progress right now, and what's potentially recommended going in, into the future. Um, there are definitely some big projects that need to get done at some point that are way beyond the scope of the revolving loan fund. Um, in particular, the DPW office and the um, water resource recovery facility office. They're both like just buildings that were built in the 60s or 50s, 60s. Um, they need a lot of work um, in the range of like 75 to 100 thousand dollars of like entire exterior renovation. The windows are falling out. Those are projects that should be on your radar as a council because they're not. They need to be in the capital improvement plan. They're not going to be going through the revolving loan fund because they're too big. Um, but they really w would have energy uh, benefits, and they just kind of need to happen anyway. Um, I'm just trying to think if there. Sorry, and that was for the um, DPW office and the which what other one? Um, the water resource recovery facility. Oh, thank you. Office. Yep. Um, so not a huge building, but. Uh, Kate, did you send that list in an email? I did, yeah, just okay. before this meeting. So oh, okay. it's, it Probably came through <laughs> probably around 6 o'clock when yeah, I was so printing this out. As long as I know where to look for yep, it. But what, what I did in the notes is I put in links um, for all of these reports. So I think one of the challenges is, like, who's holding all of this information? Right. Not clear. Yeah. Um, so I've been, you know, chasing down a lot of these reports and tried to put links to them in our Google Drive for MIAC so that we can track them down in the future. Because I think that's like one of my biggest fears is like no one's, they, the email goes around and then just kind of disappears into the ether. So um, the big project that you all have heard about many times is Organics to Energy. Um, so 
that's not really addressed specifically in this list of building improvements, but it is something that we've been spending a lot of time on. Um, there are also a lot of smaller projects that are just around air sealing and like replacing some light bulbs and um, that could be done um, potentially in-house um, if we can figure out how to do it. So the person who was a subcontractor was hired to do the windows and when she is done with all of the windows in City Hall, I think Steve's idea is that potentially she could continue and do the same thing in the fire station. Um, and could potentially be subcontracted to do some smaller um, projects. So I just want to make a note. Um, the CIP committee hasn't met yet. Is that correct? OK. Um, but we already have, we know who's on that board. Um, so anyway, I just want to make a note of thinking about um, the renovations of those offices when those, uh, you know, when that committee does meet. Okay. And the other thing, Sorry. just I put it at the very end, but the municipal buildings that have not been audited include the schools, um, and then the smaller buildings are the cemetery building, the parks department office, caretaker's house at Hubbard Park, and the rec pool building, which is pretty small because there's no heating there. Um, but one thing that is on my list is I do want to meet with the new facilities director for the school district and kind of get a sense of what their plans are right. um, and how we can coordinate because it's the school district but they are municipal buildings so they need to be part of our plan for 2030. Yeah. Great, Any, uh, Jack. This is all great. Um, <clears throat> did with the, uh, is the revolving loan fund, was it a one-time $20,000 appropriation? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I mean, we haven't asked for any more, and we haven't fully used it all up yet, so mm -hmm. there hasn't really been any reason to ask for more. Mm -hmm. uh, we will get a second infusion from Efficiency Vermont. Um, the, the restriction on their gift was they'll give us 5000 up front, and then once we've shown that we've revolved the loan twice, they'll give us another 5000 So we kind of have that promise to us if we remember then to go back to them and show them the letter on this said. committee the rest of your life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Someone <interrupted>. Lifetime appointment. <laughs> okay. Great for the questions? questions. Just wonderful work. So impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we're very thankful and looking forward to having more conversations about energy coordinators. Maybe. I'm happy to talk to you about it at any time. <laughs> All the things that could be done by okay. energy Thank you. All right. Jumping back here. Okay. Uh, police body cameras <laughs> policy. <laughs> Super. Question? Uh, I just, are we voting on anything regarding this particular policy? I don't think so. Okay. I just, I also, feel like I should disclose I am a prosecutor by day if anyone is not aware of that. Mm -hmm. So I work regularly with law enforcement um, and MPD in my day job. Um, I just, I think that should be put out there. Just, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so she knows you need cameras? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, this is uh, body one cameras, it's a big onion many, many layers, and it's nothing to be taken lightly. Um, and so tonight was a really a discussion, which is, I think can be the f maybe the first of a couple, more even community-based ones. Um, so what, first of all, I, a lot of things that are happening, one in particular that I'm, we're going to be watching very closely, there's a case that's going to the Vermont Supreme Court uh, involving the city of Burlington and the ACLU and so that I believe is will uh, be addressed by by the by the court in the, uh, in the winter of 2019 but where that's really caused me to pause not that you know not the the efficacy of, of what the uh, risk management side of body-worn cameras but it has to do with depending on the outcome of that um, the cost associated with and the resources needed to effectively be, make sure that we can comply with um, both the inspection of a, of, of, a, of a video as well as uh, the copying of it. And it has to do with redaction. 
and and after spending a little time with our, our vendor on the uh, potential vendor I should say we had a, a conference call with our team including also uh, you know, our IT staff in the city that was a lot to do with what you know with, with evidence.com is the company that we'd be looking at working with and um, so but redaction studio was one of the, these these things and but these are not automatic so anyway so so the totality of everything um, I would like to just uh, it, it they're really important our officers have wanted them for some time a couple of years now um, the, but yet there's we're also in a pretty good position in terms of relationship with the community and the trust factor so that being said I'm going to cut right to the chase that um, it'll be a conversation in our budget process but where it falls uh, it's more of a uh, you know certainly would appreciate the appropriation to have at the ready if it is the right direction to take um, but I'm gonna I think it'd be smart for us to, to be in a holding pattern right now and a lot of it, we don't have the resources even for Burlington that has a specific records division that just handles that right now as it is our department handles over a hundred public request public records requests per year and um, so we're certainly well versed in doing that and uh, but this is really a Pandora's box because of the, the balance of what we're trying to do from a risk management standpoint and 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 really accountability for the public about what, how our officers are acting especially around use of force but also w the, the exposure that the public may face and uh, the, the damaging exposure uh, if through a public re records request because we don't again under title one we can't say why are you requesting this um, and there's a significant case out of Washington State where somebody requested all of the records body cam footage of an agency uh, and a municipal agency as well as some from the state patrol and was immediately just uploading them on YouTube and I will just tell you I mean being that the capital city we sometimes are under more scrutiny than our neighbors um, so anyway it's something I don't take lightly it's a very important tool um, and and I also mentioned in my in my um, in the discussion uh, overview of why bless you, why we are interested in this technology potentially what it can accomplish um, but it's with it's a it's a real balancing act more so than I think almost anything else technology wise that we're deal that we have in in our inventory or our, our inventory. so with that said um, I can talk a lot about everything from what the, the you know where it falls in in the discussion piece of, of the president's task force report on 21st century policing in particular the use of uh, pillar three um, and also some and some very positive statistics and reduction in force as well as uh, incidents as well as officer com complaints against the officers um, so but that said I'm also concerned with somebody what happens when somebody said I hey I heard that the you know Montpelier PD responded to X establishment and took so-and-so removed and I want you know just wants that copy and then what they do with it I mean once it's out it's out so there's a lot of um, and the other things are fortunately for us our numbers are, are, are involvements with use of force we do document with that with you know with through every other means available to us um, which including even um, uh, our cruiser cams but it's a it's a very different when you put that, that camera right here and what you're going to see and also what you're not going to see and also from a from a from a prosecution standpoint uh, or even uh, looking at something after the fact there's two schools of thought also uh, for example do you allow officers to, on a critical incident view the footage ahead of time um, so they make sure they get you know one regard get the report you know as, as accurate as possible with all the information they can but then you're also taking away that's not that does not follow best practice with trauma-informed interviewing and also really capturing what was in the mind uh, thought process um, in a very traumatic uh, evolving situation so then we have to consider the, how that impacts the you know what the Supreme Court you know state Supreme Court has said about Graham versus Connor about officer use of force and, and it cannot be with you know the hindsight of 2020 so that being said there's a lot here um, the the roots of the policy that I sent out as a draft only and we, we already have since then we've already looked at also some additions we'd like to make to it um, some recommendations came from the ACLU model policy uh, specifically working talking with our school resource officer that we would not use these things in our school environment unless it was a real life and death situation that we're responding to for example the SRO would not have a body camera um, so that said um, any anything help 
what do you want to talk about this or a little do you want to talk about this? I have a bunch of questions. There's a, there's a lot here. Go for it. All right. Um, so I was looking at sort of all of the various options. Well, let's just start at the beginning. Is this going to replace dash cams or is it going to be used in conjunction with? It would be used in conjunction with, and one of the things that, uh, like our, the actual products that's in our, that are in our police cars right now, it's a company called WatchGuard, against proprietary, how their systems work. So well, one of the things that we're looking at with evidence.com, and that's why we had Seth with us on the conference call as well, we're looking at a way to, we're, instead of us managing the data in-house, uh, we would not be able to do that um, with body, the, the amount of, of data needed with the, with the body cams. So we're seeing if we can also then upload our cruiser camera to evidence.com, and we would should be able to do that. Um, so for, for, I guess it's just important, so evidence.com is a cloud-based storage that allows uh, law enforcement to send those videos out to prosecutors for discovery and also to defense counsel for discovery purposes. So once a criminal case is filed, then you get the link, in essence, to, to right. download that. It expires within a certain period of time. Uh, it can be resent if for some reason someone doesn't download it in the appropriate amount of time. Um, but it's a portal that you have to log into as as the sort of end user, whether you're the prosecutor or some other party who's receiving it. Um, what about integration with uh, CAD and um, any sort of records management? Well, we're ready to go with, rec with uh, Washington County State's Attorney's Office has not made available, um, the, ab the ability to take through Valcor the mm -hmm. full case transfer as done in Chittenden County. So that's, that used to be my day job as well. I, I, I built so. a prosecutor's case management system. Um, and so it's one of the things sort of statewide. It's a bigger conversation statewide. And so um, I know that you guys use, well, you have access to Spillman as well. No, well, there's a VGIS, VGIS what's called, right. is a, if we're sharing portal, but it's not full access. To. Okay. So these would live, it, there would be a link in Valcor with it, or is it two separate things, or would there be an API that? Um, for right now, we, my understanding is that it, uh, just as it would be right now with a mobile bat video, if there's a video exists, you know, the officers, it's documented in several locations. It's, first of all, it's in an affidavit of probable cause that there's a video, as well as it's a notation that that. Um, Okay. That there was, you know, there footage available. And um, so, in, I looked at, I looked through the policy, um, and one of the things that we've litigated across the state, um, particularly, I guess, in the last few months, I've even litigated it a, f a few times myself, um, is this question about sort of how long we retain videos. Um, and and I know for DUIs, there's a there's a particular time frame spelled out uh, in Title 23, but for other Kinds that's, of that's, that's a that's a big um, separate policy that you do you know we haven't even formulated yet, and it's something that we're wrangling with as we talk about not only data storage but also some of the flexibility and some of the uh, the options that you have with evidence.com. So, for example, um, you can set certain not uh, certain video files unless you tag it, and again uh, that can be automatically purged after you know a. a whatever prescribed time that is appropriate to also to comport with, you know, um, Secretary of State and Vermont's, Vermont's law, open records law. Uh, at any time, if we think that this encounter with, let's say as a citizen, and boy, something didn't feel right, you know, how this went, there could be litigation here, um, you know, we, could, we can keep that indefinitely through evidence.com. So, so, so that's how we would manage that. And then the rest, it would be, uh, is what, is the, what is the retention policy? And that really is something that any government, you know, municipality should really, you know, look at. And it's something we're struggling because it has to do with are we keeping boxes of hard files that we no longer need to keep um, to making sure we have uh, things. And so it's a, and, and certainly statute of limitations is a consideration there as well, both civil as well as criminal. If I can just also one last thing just on the price. Um, one of the other things with evidence.com, these are all the historically been five-year you know, I call them just deals with the devil. Um, because to lock into technology over a period of, like that, um, it's still the best, uh, it's still one of the, the best platforms in the nation. Um, and I've had many conversations with, uh, with other chiefs, uh, and particularly even Mike Sherling, who was instrumental when he was with Burlington PD of getting 
putting Valcor together. And I said, well, if you, we can do Valcor, why can't we just do, do, do something like this on our own? He goes, trust me. You know, I said, no way can we replicate the, 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 the evidentiary security protocols that are in that platform. So that said, um, the, you know, personally, the cameras, uh, the initial layout, the equipment and hardware, um, but then the, um, the, the terabyte, the two, ter uh, two terabyte storage that would come with it, the ability to um, import our others, and the docking station, um, and all of that, and, and would be about $71,000, $71,900 over the course of five years. So the initial outlay is the big, the big hit, um, very comparable to what I put on the sheet. So the first year would be $29,500, and then for the next four years, it's 10000 596. With that is an automatic replacement and upgrade of the cameras in two and a half years. So two and a half years from now, we would have there would be an upgrade of camera and technology, and then at the end of five years. Um, but one for four thousand four hundred dollars. This is where I'm also learning because to, to try to keep 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 pace with the technology. Um, one area one area is uh, in the policy that that I had that I added something from the law enforcement uh, advisory boards model policy. Um, was in the event that something happened so quickly that the officers have time. I, I don't want to change their, whether it's a defensive block or drawing their weapon uh, um, in an unexpected emergency situation. Oh, darn, I didn't, you know, activate my camera. Um, one of the things we looked at is, uh, and we, would, we included in this proposal, is a, a small sensor, a piece of sensor that goes on our holsters. So if the weapon comes out of the holster and the officer doesn't it automatically activates not only that camera, but you can set it to set the cameras in a, in a, in a range around that officer. There's even devices. So we did, it, did include that in this proposal if we were to go forward with this. And there's even technology now where um, it can be done uh, if an officer is calling for help. You know, a cruiser can, and when the cruisers can activate it from in these small modules in a police car to activate all the cameras in a certain range. And these cameras have a pre-record capability between 15 seconds up to two minutes. Um, so of, of activation, similar to our, 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 uh, our other camps. So that, th that aspect of it is where it's a really valuable tool um, for, for better documentation in our investigations. Um, but again, it really comes down to how do we balance, you know, significant um, privacy challenges um, to the public uh, as well as, because um, we're, you know, we're, you know, the officers want them because it, you know, it, it, the, the few complaints that we do get, um, where we've seen that we don't, we hardly get any complaints at all around our motor vehicle stop. And I will tell you the first year when I was a sergeant, when we implemented the mobile, the, the mobile cruisers, uh, the cameras in the cars, the complaints that would come in and be like, okay, let's look at the video. And, and it's like, oh, what? And, um, <laughs> and it's the public, unfortunately, in many cases, also behaving badly. But we also know, too, in, in what, why, you know why this was so important to even talk about you know in the in the in the uh, task force report on 21st century policing is that in parts of the country there's a huge divide um, a deficit if you will of between the you know of the police and the public and and so in some areas you know it would be a, a much higher necessity that, than that than I feel it is in my pillar at this time because we need to demonstrate to the public hey you know our, our use of force maybe is through the roof we need to get those numbers down. The public thinks that we're just, uh, you know, um, out of control. So therefore, the body camera is a, is a very um, important device to say, look, well, let's look at how we're, how we're, what, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, so that said, we are not perfect here in my player. We're going to continue to make mistakes. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I feel strongly that we have a good relationship with our, with our community and we want to be always always want to be accountable to our community so but at this time there's so many things and right now I, I would like to uh, I think the smart unless a uh, smart move would be to hold off and let's see what first of all what the Vermont Supreme Court does because um, I, theoretically if this if the court says to um, that even if you uh, have to go ahead and make those redactions for just a viewing that's still time to do that and and, and again, we're already we're dealing with a lot of big city issues as a police department for a very small police department, and I don't want to come back and you know I'm, to say, well, we now need to hire, and that might be in the future anyway, 
but a, a full-time person, that's all they do, is handle um, these records requests. So. Uh, just, yeah. I just have a couple more things. Um, so uh, I suppose first off, we did talk about this, um, this proposed um, policy change along with the, the sort of plan. Um, and the committee was comfortable with me reporting back that the committee supports the idea generally, but would like to sort of see that policy and, and be part of the community conversation mm -hmm. sort of with what that looks like. Um, the only other thing that I will point out now, I can touch base with you directly because I've done these kinds of implementations before. Um, data storage is like the most significant part of this. Um, and I was just looking at the fine print. I think it's 625 per gigabyte if we go over whatever plan it is that we have. Um, and sometimes, you know, encounters take quite some while to investigate, which can truly, if you've got a few officers on scene, that's multiple gigabytes of, of, of video for just that one case. Um, and so in looking at the, the pricing information that was included with our stuff, um, my hope is that we would be looking at unlimited um, storage. I know it's pricey. Well, the, the 71,900, that was the uh, two terabyte storage. So it is. Um, oh, that seems like uh, a little bit different than what we. Than yeah, what I, what I had was something was on the, from the website on okay. um, from 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 uh, Axon. Okay. And then this is. Um, then after working through all the, uh, which, I, which I didn't have at the time when I right. presented the packets for you, this came, this proposal um, came after the conference, the scheduled conference call that we had, so I got that Friday, um, and we talked about two or going to three terabyte, two, two, and that was, um, so they, the company thought that was sufficient for um, our anticipated usage and needs. And do they do like sort of tiered storage? So for example, like your most recent cases would be the quickest to access and then they sort of bump it down. No, the it older should, be, okay. any, should have automatic access to any one of these regardless of okay. the time frame. Um, all, one of the things that they would need is uh, again, what is the, what, is, what would our retention cycle be right. and mm -hmm. the policy around that. And, and, there, um, and there, there is some guidance from the, uh, uh, in general, on, on record retention from the Secretary of State's office, which we, uh, Chris Hepburn uh, has also uh, had training on. She's our uh, administrative uh, assistant for our public safety support services. Um, but this is, but usually these fall on the the, uh, the captain, uh, Neil Martell, or one of the sergeants, um, to manage those records requests because we don't have a staff, you know, legal counsel, and many of these we have to go through and. Uh, um, you know, it's it, in Title One, Section Three Seventeen C. The exceptions are, are pretty clear, but the impact of uh, of Title of, of Three Seventeen you know, with all this information that because it now sits with the law with the uh, Montpelier PD, um, it's it's a real you know people need we we as a community need to be absolutely clear eyed to what the exposure is as well as the risk management side because I mean the risk management side for me there, there's a, in, since I've been chief in, in 11 years, less than five cases that we've been involved in where, man, I wish there was additional footage um, and, and, um, and, and things that we've been successful. But it, 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 even when we don't, even though we've not lost and, I, and nobody wins a, a, when, we're, when we're sued, but, when we, but, but the times have changed too that we just roll over and we had one that almost went to the Second Circuit um, some time ago. And we didn't pay a penny other than, uh, of course, our legal costs. Um, I've got to wonder that had the video cameras been, been on scene, we had an audio recorded because of our cruiser cams. But that may have presented, prevented some of that, ex that litigation. So, um, and, and again, as we know, this investment might be, you know, pale in what a payout could it be or, um, you know, what the impact on that. So. I would just caution the council that if there is an ask that we do sort of fully fund the the storage piece is the most critical piece and if there's any overages it's hugely expensive and you're locked in for years with these contracts um, so I would just I just put that out to my fellow council members because it's a really it's a it's a significant investment but as long as we are smart about it and we sort of do our due diligence up front and I know chief is all over that um, as as are the law enforcement partners it's just 
critical that we fully fund it and, and don't sort of like, oh, well, we'll just do this for now. You know, if it's something that we're going to do, we need to, to commit to doing it and doing it the right way. Um, Jack, you had a question, then Donna. I, I do have a few points. I, <clears throat> I looked at it. I think this is great. I think uh, we're definitely, I, I support the idea of moving forward on this. Um, I reviewed the draft policy and the, you know, the ACLU has a model po policy. I don't know if you've consulted with the Vermont ACLU to talk about, you know, try to get them to review what we're doing and uh, get some ideas. I think it would be a good idea to do that. No, I've uh, got their, their I, I've not, uh, um, I haven't had any relationship with Jay Diaz. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, um, as far as talking about those, uh, but I do have and I have reviewed the June 2018 uh, model policy from the ACLU. There are some really important good points. That's one of the things I would like to add, some things I'd like to add to our model policy as a most specific one that I think we were missing, even though we in, in, act, in practice we wouldn't, but is the schools. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other things that absolutely I would not support. Um, and at the end of the day, it's, it's a policy that I have to implement. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the men and women of the Montpelier Police Department are my primary responsibility. Um, so some of the things, so it's a different lens, um, but it's still something that does involve the community support conversation. And I think this is a much greater conversation um, beyond for tonight for the Montpelier community that I would love to, to have, even in a town hall type, uh, maybe a coffee with a cop on steroids, if you will, <laughs> to look at because it's, um, it, it's 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 not just a you know uh, a, a new gadget um, that some agencies I think have taken quite lightly. Mm -hmm. One of the things, one of the objectives in the policy is the last one is to enhance public trust. Yeah. And there, I think we're in good shape because, as I say, I think as you said, I think Montpelier public has a great deal of trust in the uh, in the police department, and I would, I certainly do personally, and I don't think that. The police are doing are violating people's rights, but I would encourage you to specifically add to the objectives that we want to protect civil rights and provide accountability for police conduct, because you clearly want that. Absolutely. And uh, and stating that publicly that we're protecting all the people, including the, all the citizens you're interacting with, is a is a is a good public statement. And I also was not struck by the cost of this. It didn't strike me that this is out of line for, uh, for the value. Uh, I'll be interested to see what the Supreme Court does with, uh, with this case, because the case that's before the Supreme Court is someone who observed an interaction between the police and some other people. He was just a bystander and said, well, I want to see the video of what happened and the cost of uh, redaction was the stumbling block in, in that case. Um, and maybe there could even be a different standard for uh, costs or assessment of costs depending on whether it's someone who's been recorded on the video versus someone who, who isn't. Um, but Hopefully, we'll get some guidance from the court on that. Just real quick on that. I mean, the case involved juveniles, and, and so there was some heavy redaction. And the individual had the ability to pay, which he did, pay 200, over $220, I believe, to get a heavily redacted copy of the footage. Um, and and uh, so and the judge just uh, decision was, um, so I, you know, in the first lawsuit with the ACLU, uh, saying that's not, not right because of the cost. Uh, that's not the end. Um, so, so that's why it's at the Supreme Court now because uh, I think it was Judge Tichow, I think, is the one that said that this was um, it was a reasonable uh, cost because that was a that was the cost. Um, and, and I know just from what uh, our sergeants do, and, and Sergeant Pearson uh, was in the back of the room, and um, I know Captain Martell. I mean, a lot of time is taken um, of our folks doing this. So. That's why if we can't recoup some of the costs, operating costs, and it's it's a, so it's time will time will tell. And you're no different from any other public agency that has an obligation to respond to public record requests and also 
right. statutory uh, right to charge for certain uh, elements of meeting a request. And Montpelier does not have a, a, sp a special scale, so we have to automatically defer to uh, what's set in Title I. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So again, as, tech as we have more technology, this question is just going to become more and more complicated. I'm glad you brought up the cost for the uh, public records request because you are allowed to, to charge and I think the courts need to look at that more clearly of the burden and especially when you have to give it to everybody. So I would feel a lot more comfortable going to these kind of cameras, body cameras, if the court was in a better place and had done some real clear statements about request and <coughs> like that guy putting it in social media it just goes really quick well yeah it's, I mean it's it, not it, just your privacy but me as the victim mm -hmm. or participant in some way it just that but that totally aspect though is not going to that's not what the Supreme Court is, is addressing or just to decide and that's I'm saying that's part of the balancing act here of if, if this technology is here um, and the records available it's not for us in statute to say what is the motivation or the reason why or are you party to um, I understand if, that but it needs to be modified I think anyway well I, I, I'm understand. not I wouldn't I would not argue with you that um, <laughs> but that's uh, way above uh, my uh, my pay yeah, grade at the when, moment when you talk about risk management and accountability both of those who are involved in the activity as well as the officer. I mean, right. it's a mutual thing. I just feel we yeah. we haven't gotten everything in place within the law and with especially within the open meeting law to look at these kinds of things. And I'm really bothered about the whole regular monthly cost. I mean, those are things you go into that then you're there forever. And I just would feel to me it's a, a sign of community trust has been broken when we have to go to body cams. And I would rather see money, at least now, invested into, does another officer help everybody be safer, more mm -hmm. training, more community meetings? I would go a long ways in that direction. That's all. Yeah, I mean, it, it, going back to this, you know, to, to the report and some of the pros and cons, one is it has a chilling effect. I even feel it when I see an officer with a, with a body cam. Um, is it this, you know, is the cam, camera on or not? I mean, you ask, you're asking, you know, you're in Manhattan, you ask for directions. Is it on or not? Why are you recording me or not? Um, those little things, um, that's just me. Uh, but also, what happens, you know, and this is a concern that, that and this, these are conversations that we have been batting around uh, in, at our department for, for some time now. What happens if there's a records request and, and somebody, you know, is, is, you know, personally is damaged by the release of that video by another party and it's out there? Is that going to have more of a chilling effect on? Police community relations uh, is that going to pre prevent somebody from wanting to call the Montpelier Police Department mm -hmm. for help, saying, "Wow, so and so called you for help," and next thing you know, it's you know, on. it's on YouTube. Yep. Um, and, and that though that though, though that's part of why there's such a uh, you know double yeah, sword. They really talk about it a long time before. So, I think Pennsylvania that. has some of the most restrictive uh, protections around public access to body worn camera footage. But I'm not sure. But I've heard that they uh, they have a lot of prohibitions. But again, then is at some point too, does that become counterproductive to, to what you're trying to accomplish from a trust and accountability standpoint? Well, I'm uh, uh, other other comments. Oh yeah, Jack, go ahead. You probably guessed this would come up. Not anything to do with body cams, but we're all hearing a lot about the scooters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are are you? Uh, Getting reports and, and doing uh, doing like any more awareness to like get people off the sidewalks and stuff like that. The direction of staff, um, we certainly are getting some reports are trickling in, um, uh, and we have directed staff right from the start to really just be educational opportunities, not not to uh, not to to be out there to to writing tickets. Um, the the complaints that we're getting it's everything from how they operate in traffic. Uh, Sometimes people, if you're not, you know, if you look at something, the house on the scooter is going to go there. Um, something, and so there's that. Uh, we're getting complaints. Uh, there was a couple, one or two, about them being left blocking a sidewalk. Um, so that it impacts, you know, people with, you know, mobility and accessibility issues. Um, and we've had one so far that was uh, vandalized 
uh, and then toss over a fence on Elm Street. Um, mm. So that's the. Um, so and, and, and these are these are not out of line with what the large communities are seeing, um, and and people aren't calling us. It's not our program to say, hey, these are great. Um, <laughs> so we're generally going to have more negative comments. Uh, what we are doing to track this so we can provide as much data, in particular, you know, to the assistant city manager. Um, if it's a formal complaint like, hey, I, you know, I just had an accident with one of these things or a uh, motor vehicle complaint uh, where they're, they're, they, you know, cut me off in traffic, I almost caused an accident, um, that will be a police incident, you know, call for service. Uh, these other ones are just the general ones where I am afraid to walk downtown because um, I, I can't afford to get hit by one of these things especially with our, our age population. Those we're, we're keep trafficking on a spreadsheet as they come into dispatch. Um, and then at the end, we're going to get all that information um, to sue. So we have as, as, you know, we can be as clear as possible of whether this is an, an appropriate uh, device from a player from a safety standpoint. Again, our, um, I've kind of dodged this one with the reporters, including <laughs> in the bridge today, about what do I personally think. I, you know, I decided that they're fun. Um, but really, our concern is, is really is safety. Um, and there's, uh, there's, there's certainly uh, um, a downside that I'm a big, big fan of bicycles, potentially electric bicycles for Montpelier uh, as alternatives because I think our infrastructure is more suited to that. Uh, and certainly um, it's a lot safer to have a you know, 26 or 29 inch wheel rolling over something than, I don't know what these things are, 7 inch wheel um, when you hit a little stone pothole and what have you. Thanks. Yeah, we were both there for the demonstration. Um, but. Obviously, this is not going to work if uh, if people aren't safe. Jack, I'd just add that we will have a report for you all at some point. We're, we're collecting every shred of comment. And I would encourage the council, if you get emails with comments, feel free to forward them to me, and they'll go right onto the spreadsheet. And right. we'll have a full report for everyone. Apparently, follow Front Porch Forum, because it's gaining yes. in <laughs> Yes, it, it is. It is true. They're supposed <laughs> to have a drop, be 18 years old. And yep. have a driver's license mm -hmm. yes. yeah. and a credit card. Yes. So there may be people breaking that, but I just want people to hear that. They're supposed to be 18 years old, have a driver's license and a credit card. Right. And, you're, and I thought there was a, an app. Part of the app was they looked at your facial recognition with what was on the driver's license. No. no, they don't do that. Oh, wow. That'd be a oh, smart thing to do. And don't, let's not talk facial recognition while we're <laughs> still on this. Too far. <laughs> Man, I, they had a yeah. passport. When I and, and one other thing I want to add that, that it's, you know, some people also called us saying, I'm seeing people illegally riding these without helmets. The helmet is, rec is, is a recommendation for safety. Yes, the helmet and is common not sense. It is not a, a yeah. illegal requirement. Uh, Connor. Oh, we're on the topic of scooters. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do have the latest uh, data from the Bird Company oh. as of this morning, if people want to hear it a bit. Um, so Saturday was the busiest day uh, where there were um, 267 total rides. Wow. Uh, 3.5 rides per release Bird. I think you could look at Saturday as being one of the nicer days, like most analogous to mm -hmm. like sort of the springtime there. Uh, we've had pretty nasty weather since. Um, but overall, 180, 50 rides on scooters, um, traveling 967 miles, which would have wow. surpassed probably 1,000 today was the projection. Um, if that was to be traveled in a car, and of course it's not apples to apples because a lot of people would use this as a novelty, um, that would be 861 pounds of CO2 emissions reduced. So if we're actually looking at benchmarks here, uh, there are some very valuable stats I think we can take uh, from these devices here. So. See, that's the data we don't get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you, you, um, he can get them for you. And I, I should also say we, uh, we handed out um, at the farmer's market over 100 a, a uh, bicycle helmets uh, over the course of the weekend there. And there was a, a button on the app you can push to get a free helmet um, sent to you if you just pay the shipping cost, which is about a buck ninety nine, I think. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, can I look at the general ride set down? You said 1815? Sure, and I can loop back and write this down for you, Stephen, but uh, 850 total rides as of this morning. Okay. We are almost done here, team. Uh, we have another business, so council reports. Who would like to start? I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on Jack. Pass. Oh. 
No, I was just going to say, uh, I've gotten a lot of, uh, there's a lot of public discussion about scooters. I encourage people to keep it coming because uh, we want to be in a position to make the best decision at the end of this experiment. So I'm happy to get communications from anyone about it, positive or negative, and I've gotten plenty of both, more than about any other topic since I've been on the council. Right. <laughs> so true. Pass. I also just want to ask people who are using these e-scooters to be mind your manners in traffic. Mind your manners in traffic. If you are having fun with it and you want it to work, then it's really important that people follow the rules of the road. And I think it's delightful when I see people on it. They seem to have a lot of fun. Keep talking scooters. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but Bird does have a couple of safety ambassadors on the ground who are trying to be mindful and give people tips. Um, if anybody wants a lesson in it, they can contact. I'm happy to be the liaison on this, and I, I really appreciate it. I, I do want to give a shout out to both Sue, who's taking the lead on this at City Hall, um, and of course acknowledge that this has put uh, a bit of an extra burden on the police department, uh, who have been great partners in this pilot. Um, you know, I think it's generated robust conversation in the community, but that's largely what a pilot project is for, and uh, I think we would take any concerns very seriously, uh, but I would also encourage people to try riding the scooters, uh, because I found um, overwhelmingly uh, the positive input has been uh, from the 156 unique people who have signed up to take a ride on the bird here, so uh, there'll always be a few bumps in the road, but let's have an open mind about this. And an open road. <laughs> Good. Um, yes, uh, I am looking forward to trying the bird scooter shortly. I don't know exactly when, but any moment now. Not after 9 o'clock? Not after, shut off. yes, well, good. Uh, I'm too tired at the moment <laughs> anyway. But any, any, by, by any moment now, I mean some, one of these days shortly coming up. Um, I also want to, to emphasize that for me at least, even if we move forward with something like the electric scooters in town, uh, I think it is a small part of what I hope to do. If, if, if the scooters are useful for getting some cars off the road some of the time, then I am in favor of them. Um, and that's my broader goal. So uh, I am in many ways more excited about uh, transit op options that, for example, allow you to carry groceries or, uh, you know, other things that the scooters are, are not designed for. And, you know, it's understandable. They don't, they don't tick every box. But uh, I'm looking forward to this as, as one small step uh, to a larger goal of, of fewer cars and, and more safety, honestly, um, on the streets, because uh, the streets are not safe, streets in general are not safe because they have 3,000 pound objects driven by everyone uh, that can go 100 miles an hour. So anyway, that's my anti-car rant for the moment. And, and uh, if you want to hear more, you can show up tomorrow morning uh, at 8.30 at Baguitos. Uh, I will be happy to talk to you uh, or listen to you. I prefer that. Uh, so tomorrow I am taking a day off from school and I'm going to Brattleboro where I will be um, hanging out with the uh, cent uh, Central Vermont, <laughs> well yeah, people from the Central Vermont Solid Waste District as well as Lucas Herring, Mayor of Barrie, um, but we're going to Brattleboro to check out their um, uni um, municipally run trash recycling and compost operation as well as, I mean, they're the only uh, uh, town in Vermont that has a plastic bag ban and it's apparently been going well and so I want to hear about how they did that and um, you know how they got to a citywide or townwide uh, composting operation and um, see if we can bring back some of that wisdom so anyway more to come on that right. I just say that early voting is robust <laughs> That's Wonderful. all I will report. <laughs> yep, public hearing on Monday uh, on uh, the ballot items.
And I'll just say quickly, and you will be noticing, um, I don't know if you all remember this, but we had some funding in to do flashing lights on some of the busy crosswalks. And that was sort of, that project was delayed, but those flashing lights are starting to go in. So you'll see them at four crosswalks in town. Um, and then very quickly, there's a public hearing tomorrow night at the high school at 530 on what we might want for a recreation center going forward. Do we want to preserve the rec center we have on Barry Street? Do we want to consider building a new recreational facility that might even have a pool or two? So if people have uh, opinions, show up at the high school tomorrow at 530. Great. Excellent. Okay. So uh, without objection, we're going to consider this meeting adjourned.